It's a Friday. Good morning and welcome to the AM News. My name is Pakwisi Shandoff. Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Samo Abujinapo, is asking the police to investigate circumstances leading to recent attacks on Chief of Dompim in the Western region. Nana Nyonwa Pinyin, claimant to the stool of Dompim Pepasi, says his attack is linked to his recent outburst against political appointees complicit in illegal mining. The chief claimed that the deputy national land, deputy natural lands, I beg your pardon, deputy lands and natural resources minister George Mirikuduka operated one of the illegal mining firms. Minister Samuel Abujinapo wants the police to ascertain the claims by the traditional ruler. I think that the matches to do with the dumping, Pepeza chief, and the gory pictures we've all seen, they should be investigated. The, the police have to investigate it. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. In a democratic world, when these things happen, just as it is for all other crimes, the police has to investigate them and, and, and bring out the facts and the evidence, and then we'll deal with that. That's the way I see it, because even from where I sit, I've heard conflicting reports. Some say it was as a result of chieftaincy dispute. Some also seem to make the suggestion you've made. Some even say that it was a motor accident, you know. So you have all kinds of uh, claims. But when these things happen, the right thing to do is to investigate. So let's hold on for the police to conclude with their investigations. Yeah. Yes, the deputy minister. Oh, but that, that is a straightforward matter. The, the, the rule of this business is um, evidence, you know, because, uh, Awuni, uh, I hope you agree with me that here I am with this microphone, speaking live on national TV, I could just make a very damning allegation against you that you are this and that and that. It cannot in itself without more hold. And, and I think we should all be interested in that. Unfortunately, political people, those of us who venture into public life and venture into uh, policy positions, we are so vulnerable and we get punched all the time and we become helpless. Because any allegation against a politician because of the, the heightened suspicion, and sometimes, I should say rightly, the heightened suspicion and the cynicism uh, of, of associated with politicians, when allegations are made, it's almost like wildfire. Oh, yeah, yeah, it must be true. But in this business, the uh, fundamental test is evidence. And from what I heard, I just heard an allegation. I mean, I, I, did, I was even looking out for... For example, uh, an additional statement which you say concession A, concession B, operation A, operation C. Those are operations being run by the deputy minister. Then with that, you are even getting somewhere to begin to ask questions. But you just say that Abu Jinapo is involved in Galamse, Odamo. <laughs> that, that for me is quite, a, is quite problematic, of course. That was the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources. Now, the faith of 17 political parties hangs in the balance as the Electoral Commission of Ghana is giving them one week to justify their inclusion. These political parties, according to the latest audits by the Commission, have no regional and national presence contrary to the requirement of law. The cohort has up to next Thursday, October 20, 2022, to show proof why their registrations should not be cancelled under the Political Parties Act of 2000, Act 574. Deputy Chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Dr. Eric Bosman, has been explaining reasons accounting for this audit by the Electoral Commission. Uh, so far, uh, the exercise has been concluded. Uh, when you conclude such a major exercise, you need to have a report uh, for the uh, commissioners to look at it and come up with certain conclusions. Indeed, we had a team that went around the whole country and at the, at the national office, some of us even took part, uh, the chairperson, myself, the deputy chairman of operation, we even went to some of the offices of the political parties. And the commission is currently looking at the report from the field. And based on the outcome of that particular exercise, the commission will have to make a determination. Mm -hmm. we, when you look at the law, the law clearly states that political parties are supp supposed to meet certain requirements. For example, when you look at the district level, they are supposed to operate in two tests right. of the districts. And right. we expect that they will have regional, national offices. Mm -hmm. So as an institution which is supposed to ensure that the political parties conform according to the rules of our country and according, according to the democratic ethos, we are compelled mm -hmm. 
to make sure that the right things are done. So I believe that the commission will look at the report critically and will make the findings mm -hmm. available to mm -hmm. Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. And when we, we, we come to the realization that clearly, based on the law, some parties are not meeting the requirements to exist as political parties, we may end, the, we may end up uh, removing them from the list of political parties. Uh, I'm sure uh, that you on that trip yourself, so you, you have some first standing information as to some of the observations that you've made personally uh, on, on that tour, um, assessing the political parties. What are some of the worrying trends that um, you've identified um, with, with the interactions with some of these political parties? No, clearly, we, Ghana doesn't have a, a state funding policy of political parties. And, and this is a country, when you look at the constitution, our constitution encourages multi-party democracy. And any constitution that encourages multi-party democracy, what it actually means is that you believe in the formation of several political parties. So the EC is very, very careful trying to balance. Because if you really want to apply the rule to the letter, maybe we may end up having only one or two political I was parties just about going to in that, Ghana. The, the draw poly between uh, the NDC we may, and the NPP. Uh, so That's as an institution, we are also very mindful right. of what the constitution requires mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. Constitution encourages multi-party democracy, plurality in our politics. So we must be very careful in ha b having a balance in our system. However, it doesn't also mean that uh, parties will just be existing in names. So that when you have an IPAC, they will just come, but you go to the district or the constituency level, they are not there. So the, at the highest level of the commission, we are looking at all this so that uh, we'll come up with a clear framework which will say that because these parties don't meet cri uh, uh, criterion A or the following criteria, we are going to crack the whip and mm. maybe give them some time to put their right. houses in order. Vice President Dr. Mamudu Baumia has admonished the Upper West Regional and Municipal Security Councils to beef up security in the one municipality and its environs. He says the municipality has hogged headlines for the wrong reasons and all efforts must be made to ensure the situation doesn't reoccur. He added that government will ensure that peace and hospitality enjoyed by the peoples are restored. Correspondent Rafik Salam reports, reports from Waha. The key nugget in Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumey's speech at the climax of the Waladumba Festival was on the recent suspected ritual killings in the War Municipality. The municipality recorded 10 suspected murders in 8 months. Seven of the suspected murders were private security men. The incident caught the eye of security chiefs in the country necessitating a visit to the region by Interior Minister Ambrose Derry and Inspector General of the Ghana Police Service, Dr. George Akufudampare. Dr. Mahmoud Baumir noted that, but for the recent murders, violence and mob actions, the region was relatively peaceful, which he commended the people for their sense of patriotism. In recent times, the name of the War Municipality has been in the limelight for the wrong reasons. The region has recorded numerous cases of murders, violence and mob actions among others. This worrying trend has raised several concerns among many residents and non-residents alike. I must say that for us to make a quick to, to make quick wins on the security situation in the municipality and the region as a whole, the chieftaincy institution must play a pivotal role in that regard. I see the chieftaincy institution as a critical stakeholder in the governance architecture of the country. Let me use this opportunity to admonish the Regional Security Council and the Municipal Security Council to be on alert and beef up security in the municipality and its environs. He averred that government is keen in ensuring that peace and hospitality, which has always been enjoyed by the people of the Upper West region, is restored, thereby bridging the gap between rural and urban dwellers through sustainable facilities in these areas. I will therefore implore 
all present here today to show more commitment and diligence in our quest to restoring peace and improve the lives of our people. Now, Chairman, development brings enhanced standards of living and happiness. It's what every Ghanaian desires. Development, and particularly economic development, that brings hope for the future and appeals peaceful societies. It is no coincidence, then, that the most peace developed countries are the most peaceful. This implies that for us to maintain the peace and unity of our country, we must quicken the pace of growth. But I must emphasize that it has to be equitable growth. The Vice President concluded urging chiefs in the country to work with security agencies to ward off suspected terrorists from the country. The goals, motives, and justification for violence have changed as well, and the causes and drivers of violent extremism are diverse. It is in the light of this that the role of the traditional authorities is paramount. Involving the traditional authorities can be particularly effective and increase the likelihood of strategies for combating these acts of terrorism to generate successful outcomes. Traditional authorities can play an influential role as mediators helping communities and government bodies to work to together to address an array of public safety concerns. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam. Meanwhile, for the 15th time in as many years as the Wa Wala overlord, Wana Fuseni Seidu Pelpo, the fort has jumped over a cow to decide his fate. Rafik Salam report was at the climax of the Wala Dumba festival and now reports. A day of reckoning for the Wala overlord at the forecourt of his 104-year-old palace filled with bays of people from all walks of life, including the country's vice president, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. One half of the city people, the fourth, is expected to either walk or jump over this white cow tied and held to the ground. He is supposed to walk or jump over without any part of his body or gown touching the cow. It is the practice since the era of the first chief of the Wala Kingdom, Nasole, 400 years ago. It is a point where uh, close associates and relatives of His Majesty would be feeling that how is it going to end, knowing the implications of the two ends of the pool, success and otherwise, but God forbid anything short of a successful jumping. And then we also trust that the prayers that have always been said for His Majesty and His Kingdom by the clerics, the traditional clerics, the Leman Yuristok, and many others have always been answered by the Almighty Allah. Majority of the royals from all sides, including the landlords, the imams, the Yerinemini, in fact, the people that form the Wala State, they are in a pensive mood praying for a successful outcome of the Wana to have a successful job over the cow. That's why in this period, right at the Wana's palace, it's not time for merrymaking. It's a period of somber reflection. They are in pensive mood. For members of his immediate family, especially his first daughter, Barakisu Fusini Pilipu, who learns the rudiments of the tradition and culture for my father, a day like this will not have been on the calendar. As a result, Barakisu has not gotten the heart to be among the crowd to see through the cliffhanger. Outside the palace, there is no difference. There is apprehension. And, uh, you can see the cow lying down here. And the one on himself, alongside the family and his friends, even including me, 
We are not all happy now because this is a test case. If he fails, he will see us all money, which means that all is not well for the state. And if he's successful, you will see jubilations and other things, and uh, the day will be a great day for us. So we are all praying for him. To demonstrate his strength and ability to continue to rule the people of Wa and indeed the Wa state, made up of about seven paramounts. So it is a time we all are praying for him, looking up to God and hoping that he will be able to do what his ancestors have done before. The wall overload appeared at the forecourt wearing a talismanic smock that used to be worn by his grandfather, Napier Paul III, during challenging periods 100 years ago. He was sandwiched by representatives from the 12 recognized sects that formed the wall estate to go around the cow. The imams led the way with recitation of some verses of the Holy Quran, praying for a successful jump. Led the way with recitation of some verses of the Holy Quran, praying for a successful drum. It was tense and emotional. Few times the movement slowed, and the wana secretly peeped at the helpless cow. The crowd went dead following the drumming, signifying the completion of the seventh round, and the occupant of the Wana's palace had a 15th successful jump over the cow, extending his way. The crowd went agog and frenzied. He retired to his palace, returned, dressed in a blue-white embroidery gown known in local parlance as Bromoa, with his medallion dangling on his neck with smiles. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam. Wow. Away from that, the Ghana Health Service is asking parents and guardians to control the screen time of their wards. Children can contract myopia, which is nearsightedness as a result of long screen time. That's the information from the director of the eye care unit of the Ghana Health Service as it marked World Sight Day in Accra. World Sight Day is celebrated annually to raise awareness on blindness and vision impairment as public health issues and to influence all stakeholders to participate and designate funds to help prevent any activity of blindness. This year, Love Your Eyes was the theme used so each individual can be aware of their own eye health and be able to help others. Head of Eye Care Unit at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Honameto Afake, has advised parents and guardians to limit the screen time they give their award. Limit them. That, yeah, there must be a way of controlling their activity at home. That's what we advise. There must be a way of uh, 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 you know, limiting their activity because if you keep them all the time in, in the house, you know, just close, you know, uh, it, it's a factor that can even contribute, you know, to nearsightedness, okay, uh -huh, and uh, myopia, where, you know, they, they, they are get so close because they are used to that. But you must get them to go outside, you know, play, you know, in the past, people, children are out and you play, and so we don't have much problem. But these days, as we have said, because of you know, the, 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 the new age we are in, they are with, this, uh, with the screen and, and indoors, and it's affecting their eyes. So some of them eventually will have to be using glasses. Also speaking, Mr. Faka mentioned that individuals who spend long hours using screens must take a break after every 20 minutes to rest the eye. The, when on the computer, the screen, you know, you can have this eye strain as you continue spend a lot of time on the screen and don't, you know, uh, uh, you know try to look at the distance. That's why it's advised that after, a, uh, you know, some time, about 20 minutes of screen time, try and uh, look at in the distance, at a you know, distance of about 20, uh, 20 feet for about 20 seconds to be able to relax the eye because the muscles are, you know, are, are, are involved. So you're able to relax the eye and you'll be able to, no, have a, a, a secret. You don't have those uh, issues of pain around the eyes. Mercy Dumwe's report read to you. Founder of Breast Care International, Dr. Beatrice Biafia Dai, has debunked rumors that sucking and massaging of the breast is an antidote to breast cancer. She made the statement at Breast Cancer Educational 
and clinical screening at Accra College of Education. The Breast Cancer Educational and Clinical Screening by Breast Care International at the Accra College of Education was on the theme, Breast Cancer Won't Rest, So Why Should We? Addressing the gathering, the founder of Breast Care International, Dr. Beatrice Riafiade, stated that sucking and massaging breast by men doesn't prevent one from getting breast cancer. She added that the disease is a serious one and must not be trivialized with such a notion on social media. The fact that one's breast is being sucked or massaged doesn't mean that she cannot have breast cancer. And it will also not remove the cancer from the breast, as some people say. It's like joking about it. This is a serious disease. Sucking of the breast and massaging it will not prevent a woman from getting breast cancer. Meanwhile, the Chief Executive Officer of Provident Insurance, Michael Justice Ishen, explained the rationale for partnering with Breast Care International for such an outreach. Our motive for supporting this program is basically to help create awareness of breast cancer. We insure people's properties. These people include women and, to some, and men as well, as we are told, Breast cancer is not only a women's disease. Some survivors and students also spoke to the news team. To stop stigmatizing breast cancer patients and always acknowledge them and give them good treatment. I was taking my bath and I said, let me just check myself for checking sick. Not that I was thinking of anything negative. And as I was taking my bath, I felt something like a lump on the left side of my breast. You know that you don't want to cry, but the tears just kept gushing out because my mind started telling me you are dying. It's cancer. Remember your mother died. You will die. You will leave your children and all that. So because my children were here in Ghana, I said, no, let me come to Ghana and begin the procedures because I saw what my mom went through then. Mercy, a Dumas report, read to you. That's all for the news. For more, log on to www.myjoyonline.com. My name is Pakwesi Shandok. Do have a pleasant weekend. Bye-bye. Here we are getting ready. In fact, we are ready getting into the newspapers this morning. And I have Samuel Kojabrace, my colleague, assistant editor, uh, right here at the multimedia group. I see a What is it? Oh, the man, Samuel, could you raise now? The other one, no, no, later, I'll be home. Come on. Posts of Joy News Desk, Joy News Today. So, okay, why, why are you Joy News Prime there? Have you uh, done, done yeah, Joy News? I, I do it on Thursdays and Fridays. Uh, have you ever done the Joy News Room? Yes, I have. Okay. I don't know which bulletin I haven't tried my hands on. I've done even business before. <laughs> I think business was my first time. <laughs> you know, you'd be a solid guy. You'd be a solid guy. One of these days, we should put you on the probe. And it's good to have a feel, though. Yeah, yeah, in in yeah, these yeah. last two years, I've sure. been across the board, yeah, from cream cream to crank cream. Yeah, yeah. I think it's only the business, of course. That, That's yeah. the, the business shows I, that I, I, I think for mine, the prey should go to Abla. I think she did it. Son. Fantastic yeah. producer, producer extraordinaire. She, she did it. I mean, mm. I came in as someone who had not done TV before. Right. My only presentation, just, just as I did. Yeah. The only yeah. presentation I did on was was in my mirror. You know, I see I'm presenting on TV, but she she you know brought something great out of me. So yeah, I think kudos to her. So yeah, this morning I'm I'm I'm, I'm extending my gratitude to Abla mm. Souza. Abla de Souza. Well, uh, Abla, if you're watching us this morning, a very good morning to you, mm. and uh, thanks for being you. She can be, she can be stern, but it is. What it is. <laughs> Sometimes we fight. I remember this day on the pro bed. She was, and I also. But in the end, we all smiled, and that, that, that's the beauty of this work. Oh uh, yeah, you you disagree to agree sometimes, exactly, and then exactly. you smile right. over. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But but before we get into um, mm. the latest, mm. so today. I am sharing my thoughts, as always, Blunt's thoughts mm. on this. And I just want your take, especially as, so the sheer struggle to keep it all together in an economy being stripped naked, mm. the bare bones of our situation. Mm. We've seen the, the, the latest inflationary rate. Mm -hmm. It's gone up by about, what, 3.3%. Mm -hmm. And it's inching up again. Yeah. 
while some people will even say that, look, on the ground, that may not be our reality. Our reality may be far above that. Yeah. But you, you heard from the IMF yeah. yesterday, mm -hmm. speaking about Ghana and talking about the fact that our mandatory policy rate hikes must be managed. Mm -hmm. Else, if you overdo it, you create a big problem. You create a recession. Mm -hmm. And now, I told you, I'm on a facility. I've noticed that now they are charging me a lot more per mm -hmm. month. Mm -hmm. It also means if you're going for a bank loan around this time, yeah. Charlie, you're going to pay through the yeah. nose. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. Then, I have this transaction here. They pay me rough, say I know, because I, I had to get some money. So, mm -hmm. hmm, it's in dollars. And mm -hmm. I now have to grapple with getting, <laughs> you know, that more, with, with cities. cities. Mm. And honestly, I, I am feeling the pinch. Yeah. Okay. Because it's now, what, 11.62 11 as of yesterday. Okay. Uh, I mean, it... It, it, it hit 11.2. Mm. I mean, you would buy it then for 11.4 and the rest. Now it's 11.62. I think that all economists in Ghana, the government should probably create that opportunity for them to come around the table and look at how we can solve this. Because from, <clears throat> from how things are going, it's becoming more tougher. You know, people that I didn't expect to be seeing certain posts from, on mm. social media mm. are now posting in a certain way. I uh, was that, it that that is it the actor Prince David Osei oh, also who recently No, he says that yeah they would He says he says on, look he voted for the administration back, yeah, but they were back on demonstration. Yeah. But I am talking about people you know that I felt were comfortable in Ghana. Mm. All of a sudden saying that look if you have the opportunity to travel grab it. Wow. And, and they go and add on Ghana no and Mm. Wow. Mm. It, it means that people's realities are changing. And the earlier we find a solution to that, or why people are losing trust in, in Ghana, mm. but the better. Look, Kojo, sometimes people think, and I always get you know, fascinated when mm. people do this, when we criticize the NDC harshly, and, and we're at the forefront, mm. uh, people are like, oh, no, 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 no. Now that we're criticizing this yeah, administration, it's like, oh, da, da, we are not anti anybody. Mm -hmm. Look, if you make things go well, mm -hmm. we, we will be yeah. there for you. But mm -hmm. the point is, once things remain the way it is, we cannot stop because we I, all feel it. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I keep saying, the number of my friends who have jettisoned Ghana, mm -hmm. traveled to the UK, US, Australia, Canada this year, mm -hmm. it would shock you. Wow. And a lot, all of them, what am I saying, a lot of them are professionals. Accountants, medical people, doctors, oh, nurses, oh. all of them are going. And because there are opportunities out there for them, so they are grabbing them. Um, the, what government should know is that in its first time, it wasn't criticized as much as it has been crit criticized. It's more like a, time. maybe your first two years are more like a honeymoon period. So, but after that, anything after that. And you know what really gets me upset? Mm. Some of the rhetoric back then. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many, of, uh, how many people recall, and I'll be sharing some of them today as I share my blunt thoughts. The talk about, we have a, the best economic management team. Can mm -hmm. you even remember the former <laughs> administration's economic management team? Mm -hmm. The fact that people said, mm -hmm. at the time when the dollar to CD ratio was about... Four point something. Oh. Four point something leading to, and, and it had been brought to about, because when in January 2017, mm -hmm. it was pegged at around 4.25 mm -hmm. when this administration took over. Mm -hmm. Later, when it had gone to about 5.8, there was talk about, oh, and uh, if it had been the, the, the former administration, it would that have been at 16 cities mm. and the rest. Mm. Look at where we are. Now, the projections are that mm. by close of year, we could hit 15 cities. Mm. And you know why? I am very little enthused about that. Because all the projections that have been made, if you watch from the start of the year, oh, it could cross eight. We broke the eight yeah, very yeah, quickly. Yeah, we did. We, we did. broke the ten. Yeah, yeah, we did. Now we, did. we are breaking the twelve. I mean, they are, they, 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 the predictions are based on um, some factors, some indicators that people have access to. So if the World Bank or the IMF is telling you you are likely to break this, then you, you better take it and do something about it. I think that it's, it has come to a point where the government should, should welcome people to come up with ideas on how we can solve the, the challenges of the economy in which we are today, um, senior high schools. And I, I wonder why the Ministry of Education sometimes denies this when you see uh, visual mm. evidence of this. Some senior high school students are feeding on gari with nothing. Some are feeding on rice with 
with a soup that is yeah. meant that that is meant for I've seen I've I seen mean, two pictures of my, and videos. My, my girls, I mean, how how can that be look, for a table in a senior high school? Look, let, let, let's and face someone it. someone said this can't be a senior high school. I said, ah, no, nah. but the 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 bowl, how do you call it? I mean, I, I wasn't in a boarding school, so I didn't know. You it's call, more like it's a, a cold pantry like that. You call yeah, it a pantry, pots. pantry yeah, base or yeah. what? I mean, that's that's for a table. When you go to the senior high school and they are at the boarding school, that's for a table. Yeah. So you cannot see that and tell me that's not the senior high school. Mm. It's time that these people, government, accept the challenges and says, okay, yes, that's it. How do we solve it? I, I heard uh, Kofi Asari of the Education Board. Yeah, Africa Education Board. He says that, look, let us do cost sharing when it comes to the feeding. Mm. It's important. Yeah. You owe supplies millions of Ghana cities. You don't have the funds. Today, and, I'm being and, told and that... I, I don't get the... My, my apologies. Mm. I don't get the, the, the thinking. You're struggling, like what you're, yes, you're saying. Yeah. And the point is that parents... Mm. And in fact, the interesting thing is mm. a lot of parents have said, say, I'm going to come to my I mean, yeah. let's let's do something, mm -hmm. and it's not as though that would change free SHS. Some of you start. Everybody is for this free SHS, mm -hmm. but the point is, if it's going to continue incurring debt, which we in the end will have to pay, mm -hmm. how about you just let us take away that debt so that it doesn't lead to other major problems, mm -hmm. financial problems or economic problems mm -hmm. for us especially in, in when, the future? Especially when and, and, our and, kids and are the, the parents are willing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to pay. It's yeah. just a component of it that you're saying, you know what, parents, come on board, let's let's do this. Yeah. I mean, it could even be for a while till we have some stability, but no? Some time ago, the president made, made mention of the fact that, well, they will now be willing to have a national, we need to have a national dialogue. Have you that seen dia any dialogue? That, that dialogue should come off mm. so that we can all, you know, fashing out the, the appropriate ways of getting out of this quagmire because we can't have our children feeding on what they are feeding. It's what I saw, I was like, what? You cannot Sorry. do that to people. So let's look at it. We cannot continue also owing these suppliers. Mm. Sometimes some of these people have gone for bank loans and have injected into these businesses. When you owe them over a period, the, the how do you call it, the, the value of the money today won't be the same value uh, three or, say, four weeks to come. So it's about time government looks at how we can do cost sharing to make sure that the, the school feeding or the senior high school is really effective that our children will be eating the right meals that they have to mm. and not be feeding on the meals that they are because Charlie it's, it's, it's a worry mm -hmm. but let's get into the papers I have uh, four mm -hmm. of them this morning I know you have uh, same uh, about four yeah, or five yeah. let's get so, into uh, four. what you have the well, Daily Graphic, uh, Daily Graphic uh, big one Operation Halt 2 relaunched as chiefs MMDCs empowered uh, it says the government has launched relaunched Operation Halt 2 to reinforce the war on illegal mining activities in addition, the granting of mining licenses by the Minerals Commission and other relevant bodies will now involve the input of chiefs, regional ministers and metropolitan, municipal and district chief executives. Uh, the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, Samuel Abujinapo, made this known when he took his turn at the minister's press briefing in Accra yesterday. And uh, we were told that some fantastic results have been achieved. <laughs> Let's see how that, that goes, that there have been several arrests want to see how the law will take it up. But uh, Ben, I was at a training yesterday, and the <clears> least <throat> you can get now for this punishment is 20. The, oh, uh, you're, you're, 15, the mm, maximum is 15 25. to 20. 25. Is it 25? Yes. Right. That's, that's huge. Mm. I, I, 15 I, I, is I, not a joke. I mean, one year is not a joke. Yes. One so, year And the man, the man who was taking us through said that, imagine you leave your children and spend 15 years, which is the minimum, mm. it means that the judge cannot give you less than 15. Right. They'll give you the least he can is 15. Mm. If you spend 15 years of your life in prison because you engage in illegal mining, then you need to, you need to probably you know, take a real look. Energy analyst Kojo Poku mm. uh, said something interesting mm. to me. I think it was just yesterday or so. Mm. He made mention of the fact that we must spread the net of this thing mm. and ensure that, for example, those providing excavators, equipment, mm -hmm. if... You are found culpable. Mm -hmm. You know, you, it's not just your equipment that is going to be seized and maybe you know burnt or whatever they do to them, uh, but you are also going to receive uh, criminal sanctions or be charged with criminal sanctions. You are also going to get some prison term. And I felt that would also be a good way because yeah. they are also benefiting from the system. Yes. They are putting, look, I interacted with someone recently. He's a foreign national. He's not Ghanaian, but he's lived here for a long time. I think he's Lebanese or Syrian or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether he knows the work I do, but some of the things he said about excavators and everything, I, I was just in, 
in all. Mm. You know, some of these people and how business is not so good and yeah. this and that. And I was yeah. just thinking, we're talking people who have a hundred oh, yeah. excavators, oh, yeah, yeah. two hundred mm. excavators. Mm. Such people should be put under the microscope. Mm. And if you are giving out these excavators to people who are destroying our natural resources, mm. guess what? You're benefiting from that same system. Mm -hmm. You're also liable, okay. and you also face penalties. I agree ben, with Kodopo. So, so Ben, I think that yesterday at the training, uh, you know the new law, Act 955, yeah. brings these people under Which is it. what the AG wants yes. some of those so, who were sanctioned recently so, to fall under. Yeah, so now, when you bring your excavator in town, it is registered. It's mandatory. You need to register it, yeah. Yeah. and then it will be tracked. Tracked. And then, so tracking systems to yes. ensure that they are not deployed to mining areas. Per, per the news, no, no, you go to a mining area. I mean, okay. it, it's registered for purpose. Mm. But what's going to happen is that, let's say your, your concession is this paper that I have. Mm -hmm. There is a buffer, stone, uh, bu buffer zone mm. in the concession that you, the, uh, the excavator, if you move outside of the concession and move on to another concession, it will trigger. it's illegal. So mm. immediately you go outside this, this zone, it's the, your, your excavator is stopped from, from, from Accra, not from you. Mm. You cannot move it. You, and, you, then, you, you, hmm. and then uh, when, when you are caught engaging in illegality, it has its own punitive measures. I've forgotten exactly, and I don't want to make a mistake in quoting that. That's right. right. But, but it is, it, the, the fact is that they have been brought under the new act. And only if the problem of Ghana is law enforcement. Yeah. I was just about to say that, you see what you said? Mm. So once you get outside of your zone, yes. your area, the, mm. that place demarcated to you, yeah. someone must be able to let your excavator cease Easy. working. Mm -hmm. The problem is that someone. That, that someone. <laughs> okay. The problem is, is that, that institution. Mm. <laughs> the problem is whoever is, is going it, to is be a post. Commission. It, it, the that, that's commission. basically what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is where the problem lies, mm -hmm. because believe you me, you will see that people will do the wrong thing and get away with it. Mm. That, that's been our bane. Mm. That's been our mm. problem. Um, again, on this same thing, we, 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 are, we, are, we are keeping a little uh, longer on Galamse because it's been quite <clears throat> major this week. Now, yesterday at the, at the meeting, I was asking them, how come people were doing this in the full glare of the public and we couldn't do anything? And the, the answer was that the police, which is a law enforcer, had to do that. Now, if the police in, in uh, uh, Wase Kropong was not able to arrest the people who were mining close to the road, mm. what could the Minerals Commission officer do? So I think it is time we need to get the police to tell us why they are not able to, be, uh, to, to arrest some of these people when you see them mining close to the road. Right. I mean, mm. so we should look at that, that aspect as well. But mm. uh, let's see how this one will go. Tamale Central gets fair share of national cake. It comes mm. in a picture of a section of a Tamale interchange and a, a central mosque. Abandoned vehicle now removed. Uh, ECOWAS Investment Bank approved 250 million for five countries. I'm sure will be included. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so Ben, that will be it for, for me from the Daily Graphic. Well, let's quickly get into other papers. Ghanaian Times newspaper now. Renewed fight against Galamsey. War to target foreign sponsors to cut funding from kingpins and barons. Let's, let's take a look at that shade of the conversation. And it's in the middle spread, page 16, to be specific. The renewed fighting against illegal mining, a.k.a. Galamse, in the country is to focus on foreign nationals and the kingpins sponsoring activities of illegal miners, the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, Mr. Samuel Abujinapo, has said. According to him, the focus on the kingpins, barons, and foreign nationals is to cut the sources of funding of these uh, illegal miners and also help to deal with the menace in a very holistic and effective manner. Quote, as we say in our local parlance, if you kill a snake and chop off the head, it becomes a mere rope. So we have taken the decision to go after these foreign nationals and the kingpins, and we believe that once we succeed with that, we will make giant strides in the fight against Galamse in the country. Mm. Now, under the Minerals and Mining, Mining Amendment Act 2019, that is Act 995, the punishment for foreigners engaged in illegal mining is 20 years imprisonment plus a fine of not less than 1.2 million Ghana cities plus deportation after serving the sentence. And for Ghanaians, the minimum punishment is 15 years imprisonment and a fine of 120,000, he explained. And all these enhanced punishments, Mr. Janapo said, had been introduced to deter people from illegal mining. Like we mentioned, it's left with the implementation. Mm, yeah, yeah. 
MMDC is to face sanctions over environmental degradation, Dr. Kokofu says so. And henceforth, any metropolitan, municipal, and a district chief executive in whose jurisdiction acts of environmental degradation are recorded will be sanctioned. Executive Director of the Environmental Protection Agency, Dr. Henry Kwabna Kokofu, has warned, noting that Ghana was deteriorating into the worst state of environmental destruction. Dr. Kokofu said the time to crack the whip on environmental offenders was now. Okie doke. Ah. Um, there's also 553,408 candidates to uh, sit BEC from Monday. That's according to White. Do you know anyone who's sitting that exam? B-E-C-E. -E. Um, Charlie, mine was a long time ago. <laughs> Do you know why I sat it? No. At the Accra Girls Senior High School. Oh, okay. Which year? Okay, you give a lot out. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. 19... Let's move on, let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> Court awards 500,000 uh, damages against Sami Jamefi for mm. defaming energy uh, minister. And he said that he would um, take that up. He would uh, petition the court on that. The Accra High Court General Jurisdiction has found Mr. Sami Jamefi, the National Communications Officer of the NDC, guilty mm. of defaming mm. Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe, the Minister of Energy. The court presided over by Justice Charles Jamefi Dankwa awarded damages of 500,000 Ghana cities mm. against Mr. Jamefi and ordered him to publish a retraction and an apology to the minister. So what happened? Just briefly. Dr. Opoku Prempe in June 2019 took Mr. James Fee to court mm -hmm. for def defamation and wanted the court to fine him one million for defamatory statements against him. Apart from the cash fine, the writ of summons filed on June 25, 2019 uh, by Sakwadi Abafwe, Wai and Partners, lawyers for the plaintiff, had asked the court to order Mr. James Fee to retract and apologize for the defamatory statement within seven days after the judgment. Those are the stories, major ones, in the Ghanaian Times today, hmm. shall we? Okay, uh, let's move on to the Daily Guide. It says, NDC Galamsey hypocrisy exposed. Why are they saying so? It has emerged that former NDC Member of Parliament for Akwetia, Baba Jamal, offered legal representations in court to five Chinese nationals who were accused of engaging in illegal mining activities contrary to claims. Some members of the opposition NDC took offense when news broke on Tuesday that uh, the immediate past national chairman of the NPP, Freddie Blay, is the lawyer for some three Chinese nationals and one v Vietnamese standing trial at the High Court 5 for illegal mining related offenses. So, I mean, that's uh, how they run around it. But again, I grab that denied bail again. Now, self styled evangelist Patricia Asiedu, uh, Asiedua Odro, also known as Nana Grada, was yesterday remanded into police custody after an Accra Circuit Court once again turned down another application for bail made on her behalf. She was, a, she was hauled before the court last Monday for allegedly defrauding a number of people by deceiving them she could double any amount of money they gave her. And I'm told that the police have received over 30 complaints so far. Again, military takes over Galamse site. I'm contesting over Swampo for General Mosquito. It's official. Yeah, it is. It's official. Yeah. No, he's going for but, a That is going to be an interesting yes. duel. Very, very interesting duel. Very. Looking at the pedigree very. of John Sinesi yeah. who, yeah. who bit, uh, you know, uh, who, uh, what, what do they even call him? Um, is there, is there, um, what's his uh, name? Koku Anidoho. Koku Anidoho. <laughs> the bull, you know. Who, who showed him that a mosquito can, uh, yeah, can destroy give you something? Giant, and, yeah. uh, that, mm -hmm. that was that. But, yeah. but facing off with Samuel Fuswampo, yeah. Sami Foto, mm -hmm. as we affectionately call him, that, 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 is, it will be that is going to be quite a duel. Because the two people are colossal when it comes to the NDC. They've all mm -hmm. been through the ranks. Mm -hmm. You know how Sami Foto started and where he's got into. How, I, I think they've all been... Mem former members of parliament. Has Sami Foto been a member of parliament? I am before? not sure. Of okay. That. I'm but not certain. Mos but Mosquito has been. He has been. Yes, he has been. Um, if you look at the, the worth of a. I think he still is on one of the parliamentary subcommittees or something. He was, no, no, he was uh, given uh, an appointment. The, 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 the board. The yes, the board. board yes. yes, one of the subcommittees on the, on the board. He is on, on a the member board. of the board. Yeah. And yeah. I think he's, he's on one of the. the you know, they have administrative uh, oh, okay. uh, operations. Okay, I know that he's on the board. But he is on the board. Yeah, it will be interesting. He's been general secretary for how long? Is it 30 years Donkey or so? years. Donkey I, years. I mean, I think he's the longer serving yes, uh, yes, yes. You know, so, so executive he, in the past. He has a grasp on the grassroots. Mm. 
this, this is an executive that every regional executive today has a relations with, even current and former, yeah. you know, executive, yeah. have a relationship with. And he's, he's, he's liked by many. Samuel of Usampofo is also one that is like, you've mentioned Sami Foto. He it's also not. is a juggernaut. Yes. And he's also established himself. Yes. So this contest is going to be, it is no one's contest. It is everyone's to lose. The D -Day will I like win. the way you put it. Exactly. I mean, there's no favorite. In Do you think the party could end up losing from this? Because like it or not, there are mm -hmm. those who would follow Johnson S.A. Mm -hmm. whatever he goes for. Mm -hmm. Even if I think he were going for the flag bearer ship, there, were peop there, there would be people who would say, he's the man. Yeah. And Sami Foto mm. <laughs> has also been in the fray, and yeah. he's not going anywhere. You remember when he was asked about whether he felt threatened mm -hmm. by uh, an mm -hmm. Esiedun Ketia coming after, and he said, no, no, no. I mean. I've, so it, 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 some have asked whether in the end mm. one would win, definitely. Yeah. But will the party lose? The that's, party, that's the question. The party won't lose. The party sees 2024 as theirs to lose. And therefore, they will do everything to win it. Mm. I mean, they will not allow a mere intra-party intra election mm. to derail their, their chances of winning 2024. So I'm, I don't see them breaking apart as a result, as a result of this contest. Mm. I am seeing them to even become more stronger after the elections to ensure that they win. But Sami Foto has been the chairman for their past uh, two lo losses to the MPP, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. 2016, yes. 2020, yes. isn't it? So yes. that's something that you would expect that Sidhu Ketia camp to use against mm. against him. Yeah. So let's see how that, 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 that plays out, really. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's quickly look at the next uh, few stories. In about um, six minutes, we should uh, get it all done and dusted. The final yeah. newspaper says... Um, and I'm going to avoid the other stories we've done. There's proba Kunta Mining, Directors uh, Halt Small Scale Mining Media Coalition to Government. So I like the way some of these CSOs are also keeping, just as we in the media are mm -hmm. keeping the pressure on mm -hmm. when it comes to Galamsey. We say no to Galamsey and yeah. the fight will not stop. Yeah. And I mean, we've had our meetings, we've had our thoughts, and we've deliberated with ordinary Ghanaians. The fight is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. It is here today, tomorrow, the day after, forever. If it, if it takes that. Mm. But the media coalition against Galamsey has called on the government to order small-scale and surface mining activities to stop immediately to allow water bodies and forests to begin to restore. The government is also encouraged to bring sanity to all surface mining activities in the country. The coalition in a statement admonished the government to ensure that the Minerals and Mining Act, uh, Act 703 as amended, was enforced without fear mm. or uh, favor. Yeah. They make a number of points in there. If you want further details, get on to... Uh, page six of mm -hmm. the paper. There's also on page seven, breast cancer is not a death sentence. Mm -hmm. And it worried me recently. Uh, I think there was a random check uh, by one institution, and I think 50 to 60 percent of those who were screened had, you know, mm -hmm. some, some issues. And, and that is a big concern did you, did when you it comes to, to. Did you go to check yours when they came to uh, multimedia? Um, no, uh, I didn't. I went to check mine. Right. And they declared, said, oh, I'm fine. Uh, I'm okay. So, so now I'm confident that I'm okay. You are confident you're oh, okay? Oh, yes, yes, yes. You need oh, to. Uh, okay. You should have been there. The way they. But I've noticed you have some. For, yeah. For, for, for like, you know, when they're going to say. For, oh, that, that thing. The, for, for how like, do you call it? For, for like. For, for like, that's what. For, 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 for. I don't know for, for now. Bre breasts. I mean, how can I have breasts? Me. Ah. I have this one. It's not breast. Uh, why you? Oh no no! But this is not breast. This is but, my but chest. But I've seen, I've seen. Oh, some please, you have expression seen, of. Don't you have seen any? You haven't seen anything. Don't don't ah. uh, don't say. But you know, I think about it, it's about one percent of men mm. who actually yeah end up getting yeah, yeah. breast cancer. So it's not just a woman's no, thing. No, no, don't mm -hmm. assume that. Mm -hmm. We've always made mention mm -hmm. of that. Uh, Th but that's on, it on, the, the, on the back of the Akunta mining thing, yesterday the Lance Minister spoke to MFR Pao. Mm -hmm. And he revealed that the oh yeah yeah the, I, the, I did the forestry yes. commission is investigating the circumstances under which Aquanta mining entered the forest mm -hmm. because the law is that um, you you cannot they, they, they do not know you cannot are, are, you, are you saying they do not know mm -hmm. you cannot after enter. after they were there for how long yeah yeah that's 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 also so we have mm -hmm. to push to under, to to get the result of this particular investigation investigation he's talking about but the Chronicle says uh, blame military if Galamse fight fails. It is high time um, military high command which will be held uh, accountable because nobody, not a minister, not a politician, not a religious leader, not a chief is allowed to call the commanders in their field to say do this or do that. Oh, okay. 
So that's where it is. So the military commanders have to ensure that we win this fight. Uh, General Price talking tough after redeployment of soldiers. That's it. We will contest 2024 with our own referee, uh, John Mahama there. And he says that they have to ensure that they go in there with things that can help them win. Um, so it's not as if they are going to come in with their own electoral commission. That's not it. He explained further in that particular interview. Um, he says that uh, the, um, so a lot of things went wrong. We have done our post-mortem. We realized that we have to go into the ring with our own referee. Now, when pressed by the interview on what he meant by that statement, the eloquent communicator and historian, after a brief pause, managed to cite how there was no space on the, uh, on the pink sheet to record the number of people verified biometrically. He later said he made a statement, and I quote, going into the ring with our own referee as a metaphor because of a boxing bout that former world champion Azuma Nelson had with Jeff Finich in 1992 in Australia. Azuma has stated that his referee would be his gloves. So once he knocked down the opponent, the fight had been decided by him. That's what uh, John Mahama is saying. Okay. All right, uh, I'll wrap with uh, uh, two major stories, one from The Custodian, the other from the Ghanaian publisher. So, so the story from The Custodian, mm -hmm. EC to ax Reku Brobe's defunct UGM and 16 other parties. Stories that I mean, you've heard of those uh, 17 yeah. parties that mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. affected and likely yeah. will be on the chopping block yeah. of the EC. But, Yesterday I, ha I heard um, uh, Akbalu, Kofi Akbalu yeah. of the LPG, mm -hmm and others, or DK, or, uh, join the conversation and talk about what this uh, means. Mm -hmm. There's also, j just let me add, rope in this story and then mm -hmm. you can react to them. In the Ghanaian publisher, non-payment of contractors, reason for stalled uh, roadworks highways. So Mr. Philip Samini, the Upper East Regional Director of Highways, has decried the non-payment of road contractors, saying it is the major reason most road constructions in the region are not completed. Quoting him, he says, for example, the partial reconstruction and upgrading of the uh, Sumbrungu through the Bolgatanga Technical University to Zoko and Namok Highway has stalled because the first certificate raised by the contractor at 8 million Ghana cities for the 12-kilometer part of the road has not been paid. Mr. Samini said this in an interview with the Ghana News Agency in Bolgatanga when he gave an update on road construction in the area. So two issues, uh, mm -hmm. the Electoral the, the Commission on the Political Parties and Contractors not being paid. Quick thoughts? Uh, very, very. For the contractors, I think it's about time government has to find ways of paying them. Mm. But the reason why most of our roads are the way they are is because the contractors have put yeah. in money, yeah. they are not being paid. Yeah. I know one man, Asabia, he does a lot of work and he's not paid. So it's about time the government looks at how we can finance our roads. Um, on the political parties, well, uh, the law is clear that you need to have national presence. You need to have presence in the constituencies. If you don't have it, it means that the basic condition upon which you need to fulfill for you to be a political party is not there. So why do you still, you know, stay on the books of the AC? So I right. think that if the AC is applying the law, let's 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 uh, support it to apply the law. Let the law be applied. And yeah. this is a call that some other political parties, some other prominent people in the country have mm -hmm. always uh, mm -hmm. put forth. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I, I've forgotten whom I heard from the. I think it was Felix Wachufosu mm -hmm. who said that this had been a call from for the NDC. Mm -hmm for donkey years, mm. and that uh, at best for them, mm. it was just in response uh, to that. But let's take the politics out. The point is we need to weed down yeah. uh, any political parties that are not serving the purpose yeah. per the constitution, doing what yeah. is identified. Mm. And I think it's only a step in the right mm. direction. Because if the reason, is, if the precondition is that get national president, and you don't have it, right. you don't have officers in the constituencies, of mm. course, the EC has to crack the whip. Right. Unless, of course, the law says that you can right. be in existence without those things. But if it is a major prerequisite... It's a prerequisite, so that course. is it. You, let's let's, let's wrap with the well, Republic Well, um, Republic Press says, Gender Ministry turns blind eye as charlatans. Charlatans exploit mm -hmm. sick children. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a whole thing of people parading sick children in the street to mm -hmm. demand for arms. Um, you know, the, 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 the accusation is that the ministry responsible is not you know, looking at that particular practice to, to ensure it ends it. So it's a call on the gender ministry to ensure that it does uh, put an end to that practice. Mm. Mm. Uh, there's also that um, bit about Agrada in high spirits yeah, as yeah, she yeah. sings into, into the, the cooler. cooler. <laughs> she was singing yesterday as she was being taken to the police, police car. So yeah, that's what the paper is referring to. She was it singing. reminds me of this. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's it. She's still in the cooler. 
Oh, yeah, she's still there. I'm not sure. glad, uh, the thing is, I'm not sure that singing girl will change anybody. So let's see. Let's see how it goes. Am I? Oh, I think. But this woman had there been several allegations of, about her. But let's see. You mentioned what? Goes. About 30 pending. Yeah, 30 people have, have brought up complaint. But when the issue broke up, people were like, this woman had done it before. How do you still allow yourself to, to, to be fooled in terms of money doubling? You remember last, about some four or so years ago when there were a lot of issues about his hey, money doubling issues? You remember that? that the, the, there's no time for this, but I'll just bring uh, this up about that fraudster who, you know, just a, a few days ago oh, was trying to... You, we, you invited me yeah, to... Yeah. It, it's actually in we, my blunt thoughts. We need to, we need to educate one. people yeah. to be wary of yeah. their calls or the numbers that call them. Mm. This one, you know, it, it almost got me because it was a landline. Mm. Apparently, the way the guy was speaking, then you were smart enough to say, tell him you go to a branch. Mm. Immediately we said, we'll go to a branch. Because he wanted you to key in those details. Yeah, and, and I said, and I no. Said, tell him you're going to the branch. Yeah. And he ended yeah. the call. Because the message even comes with the, the notice that we will not call you for your PIN. So why is this guy says he's from this bank and Charlie, this? So mm. really, it is well. We need to At least out. I'll give it some space in my blood. Do, 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 do. Uh, Thank you, my. Have a good day. Uh, you too. And a very good day to all of you as well. <laughs> Up next, we serve you sports. After that, I'm coming to you with my blunt thoughts. Water, water. Stay. Good morning. Welcome to AM Sports here with me, Muftao Nabila Abdullah. From Ghana International, Ni uh, Odate Lamte says. The Black Stars do not have the quality to compete at a FIFA World Cup. According to him, teams like Portugal and Uruguay have improved since the Black Stars last met them in the 2014 and 2010 World Cups, respectively. And he feels that with a current crop of players, he's afraid Ghana might not qualify beyond the group stages of the tournament. When I saw the group we are in, uh, personally, I wasn't happy. It saddens me because I thought I would have preferred to be in a group that we have we we hadn't played with them at the World Cup before. Football. Yes, the reason is I mean uh, football has totally grown now, and uh, uh, I look up, I look at uh, Portugal now. I mean, they've grown. So playing with them again at the second time at the World Cup is going to play, be a problem for us. Likewise, Uruguay. Korea, we have, we have not grown. We, we, we haven't grown, but I think we have materials that, yes, we can grow. You see, I think this, our, uh, the boys that I've seen in camp now, the 30 man squad that Utu, the technical team, excellent. It, Utu, Boatin, Didi, and Ku, yes. excellent. Uh, yes, the problem is young squad having played a, a competition because I can say maybe 10 of them have been in maybe Cup of Nations before. None of them have been together in a competition before. That's where my problem is. And playing with such a country that are very experienced, you know, both Uruguay and Portugal, for me it's a problem. But I pray that we should cross the group stage. But do we have the quality to cross the group stage? I mean, we, uh, yeah, we have. We have players that we can. As I said, my only question mark is the team that we are facing. If, like, we are playing with other countries, other countries that, uh, I don't know, we have not played before, I'm sure we should have. But with this one, for me, I have question mark. You have question marks as in we can, we can, we can do well in this tournament? Yes. The full interview will be coming your way on Sunday at 9 p.m. here on the Journeys channel. It is Prime Take. Let's go and talk about Accra House of Oak, who have a mountain to climb at the Accra Sports Stadium on Sunday. The Phobians need to score four goals without a reply against AS Bamako to book a ticket to the next round of the CAF Confederation Cup uh, faces. And it seems uh, it is a mission impossible for many, but Mohamed Al Hassan and supporters are very optimistic of a turnaround. My colleague, Elon Benaya, the firm of has a rest in this story. So folk are fine-tuning preparations ahead of Sunday's make-or-break encounter against the Malians. 
the 21 time Ghana Premier League champions are on the brink of elimination following their 3 0 loss in the first leg in Bamako on October 8. Skipper of the Continental Club Masters, Mohamed Al Hassan, tells Joy Sports his teammates are raring to go. Looking at how uh, training is going, we are well prepared, focused uh, towards the match we'll be playing on Sunday because uh, when we came back, we sat down talk to ourselves that going in uh, going into that match we need to prepare more than 100 percent so that uh, we'll be able to qualify and looking at what we're doing at the training ground we are very much focused and we did everyone is on his peak we are all fighting because uh, it's not going to be an easy tact but uh, with uh, determination hard work we are going to uh, put in every effort to uh, qualify for our darling club. Haas must score four unanswered goals to stand any chance of making the next round of the CAF Confederations Cup. Their fans are optimistic. I'm very sure. We just, yes, we just scored the fourth goal in this very match we are watching. But this team is not uh, the same as the team you are going to play on Sunday. And we are going to play the same tactics. That, this is the tactics that we are going to use on Sunday. And uh, I, I tell you we are going to win by four goals to near. I'm very, very sure. You know, they have they have new coach in place now. And you can see from the mother they are playing, is working on that. So far, you can see that we have scored about three goals. So definitely, I'm sure, 100% sure that this is going to translate on Sunday. Inshallah, we are going to qualify. Of course, yes, we can. We have done some before. Uh, House of Folk is a mighty team. Uh, three nil defeats in African soil is not something that to it will bring us down. We believe in our boys and we have confidence we are going to score them on Sunday. The Phobians are the 2004 champions of the CAF Confederations Cup after beating Swan rivals Asante Kotoko in Kumase. The latter have since struggled in the competition, crashing out after a 4 2 defeat against Algerian side Saura last year. Still, on the African continent, the Confederation of African Football has responded to reactions by Hazaka's ladies and other clubs that participated in the maiden edition of the CAF Women's Champions League that took place in September 2021. CAF, in an email to the clubs, indicated that there was no prize money set aside for the competition and thus they are not giving, going to give them any prize money. Spokesperson for the continent football governing body, Lack September, has been speaking exclusively to Joy Sports. And he says it is deeply disappointing to see this debate about such a beautiful success story that is CAF Women's Champions League, the first on the African soil. This competition is about uh, crowning African football and that he feels on the issue of prize money. CAF spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on the first edition, there was no prize money announced. When a discussion came after the tournament, the president said it wasn't fair to announce prize money after the competition. This was the correct approach. Of course, that's what he is claiming. We cannot spend energy on this. We should spend energy on growing our product. We need to get over this negative energy. The first edition of the competition was wholly funded by CAF. It was a commitment made by President Mosepe. Quite an interesting one from Lack September, who is a communications director of the continent's football governing body. One era, however, he did not address was the March 2022 letter from Ali Rafa to the class asking them to make available their bank statements or their bank accounts so that the money should be paid to them. Again, in April, Ali Rafa told the clubs that payment of prize money was going through what he described as internal procedure. But now, CAF says they spent lots of money in organizing the competition. Hence, they will not be giving any money to the clubs. Well, that's an issue that will continue to run. Um, Joy Sports have established contact with other clubs that participated in the tournament, and they've all expressed disappointment over the position of CAF. And in fact, people within CAF, within the, the organization of women's football at CAF, all feel disappointed about this development. Still, on things that have to do with women's football, but now, in Ghana, 
on uh, just a couple of days ago, the Ghana Football Association launched the Women's Premier League. A president of the football government, the Kat Okriko, says his administration will invest in the sport. He has invested and will continue to commit the right levels of investment in women's football. As we speak, we are here talking about the Women's Premier League. But I'm sure soon we'll also meet on similar platforms to speak about the Women's Division 1 and perhaps lower leagues where women are encouraged or girls are encouraged to realize their dreams. The Football Association called upon corporate Ghana to come along and to believe in our vision to give opportunities to our ladies, to our girls, to realize their dreams. The Football Association is very grateful for the trust, for the belief, and for your undiluted desire to support women's football in this country. Can we give it to her, please? Let's go to Europe and Thursday night specialist. That's class that compete in the Europa League. McTominay, he scored stoppage time winner for Manchester United against Ammonia. Saka was also on the score sheet for Arsenal as they near the knockout phase. This weekend, there will be many matches in Europe. Let's start from England, where the English Premier League is gradually separating the boys from the men as the competition continues. Brentford will come against Brighton and Hove Albion tonight. On Saturday, it's Leicester versus Crystal Palace. Fulham will come up against AFC Bournemouth. There's Wolves versus Nottingham Forest. Tottenham Hotspur will play Everton. Everton, they have been struggling in this year's Premier League. On Sunday, Aston Villa will play Chelsea. Leeds United will come up against Arsenal. Manchester United will also play Newcastle United. Southampton versus West Ham United. And the big one on Sunday is Liverpool versus Manchester City. Manchester City has been firing from all cylinders. Liverpool, they are struggling to find their feet and continue the momentum they have always had under the tutelage of their manager, judging club. To other fixtures in Europe, and um, this is uh, La Liga. We have Rayo Vallecano versus Etafe. That game is tonight. Tomorrow, we have Girona versus Cadiz, Valencia versus Elche, Real Mallorca versus Sevilla. Baba Idris is likely to be in action against Sevilla. Aliko Bilbao will come up against Aliko Madrid. There is Ghanaian interest because of Inaki Williams and his brother Nico. They'll come up against Aliko Madrid. On Sunday, Celta Vigo versus Real Sociedad. There's likely to be another player in action, which is Abdul Mumin. Real Madrid versus Barcelona, which is the El Clasico, the big one in uh, Spanish La Liga. Espanyol versus Real Valladolid, Real Betis versus Almeria, and on Monday is Villarreal versus Osasuna. These are the fixtures for the La Liga. And um, in Serie A, Empoli will come up against Monza, Torino versus Juventus, Atalanta will play Sassiolo. On Sunday, it's Inter Milan versus uh, Salernitana, there's Lazio versus Udinese, Spezia versus Cremonese, uh, and uh, Guardian player Felix Afinajan returned to training just uh, a couple of hours ago, hoping that he would be available for the fixture against Spexia. Napoli versus Bologna. Hellas Verona will come up against AC Milan, who have been on some sensational form this season as they seek to defend their title. On Monday, it is Sampdoria versus Roma and Lecce versus Fiorentina. These are the fixtures for the Italia Serie A. And in the Bundesliga, Schalke 04 will come up against uh, 1899 Hoffenheim. This is tonight. On Saturday, it is Eintracht Frankfurt versus Bayer 04 Leverkusen. There's Werder Bremen versus Mainz 05. Stuttgart versus Bochum. There's Wolfsburg versus uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach. RB Leipzig will come up against Hertha Berlin. And on Sunday, FC Köln will come up against Augsburg. Union Berlin versus Borussia Dortmund. Bayern Munich versus Freiburg. 
And this is a game. Uh, Daniel Kofichwe is likely to be in action against uh, uh, Bayern Munich. And then Ligue 1, Strasbourg versus Lille. Um, Alexander Jiku in action versus Lille. Laurent versus Rheim. Lens versus Montpellier. And we are also going to, likely to have uh, uh, Kamal Din Suleiman, his Rene will come up against Lyon. There's Monaco versus Clermont, which also has a Ghanaian interest. Paris Saint Germain versus Olympic Marseille. One of the fixtures in Ligue 1 that is always dwarfed by off the field issues instead of the action on the pitch. This is how we wrap up sports here with me, Muftar Nabila Abla. The show continues right after this. And it is the blunt toss of Benjamin Akako. Another Friday, another opportunity to share with you, Ghana for my blunt thoughts in the national interest. My name is Benjamin Akaku, and this morning I've titled my piece, The Sheer Struggle to Keep It All Together in an Economy Being Stripped Naked. The bare bones of our situation. Come with me. Fellow Ghanaians, our economy is getting battered. It's taking a daily beating. It's being picked apart the same way a bad football team would be decimated by an excellent and well-organized one. Every morning we wake up, the city has lost value, slumping it even further to international currencies. Or the monetary policy has been hiked, further inflicting economic pain on us, the people. It's beginning to feel like an incessant bludgeoning with a sledgehammer that leaves ordinary folk, from businessmen and women to consumers of products, with daily monetary hemorrhages and financial nosebleeds that simply have no cure. There is no respite no proper policy direction, and nowhere to run. From Azim to Zabzugu, the economic temperature of the Ghana man is at breaking point. The Ghanaian has always been known to be an economic wizard who can pull all kinds of strings to stay afloat, even in the most turbulent times. Pa, 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 we call it. What I see now, however, tells me the ordinary man is either losing his touch or the economic bite we are facing is crushing his bones with more pressure than even a saltwater crocodile can master in his dreadful snapping jaws. In simple terms, Ghana for ye huso, ya bre, we're tired. What the heck is this? Can we even call this disastrous horror show an economy? Do we have an economic management team at post, or have they paid too much attention to medical song and so gone to sleep? Semwada, monsori na boys are pa. When some six years ago, Vice President Baumia taunted the former administration's economic management team, asking whether anyone could remember them, some of us were both skeptical and amused at his tongue-in-cheek profusions. We all had a good laugh, however. After all, our economic messiahs had arrived. A fantastic economic management team, in the Veep's words, had been put together. Professor Jan Bafo, Dr. Akoto Osei, Dr. Efri Akoto, Alan Chemating, Bwachi Jako, Ken Uforiata, Yao Safu Mafu, and of course, Dr. Baumia himself as head of that team. What a solid team, the vice president exclaimed. Finally, we're going to see economic management like never witnessed before in our nation's long and proud history. Well, we have seen exactly that in its worst form. An economic stake has been driven through our trusting hearts, and now we can only gnash our teeth in anguish for having been so gullible. Yes, gullible. How else can I describe it when we're promised production and slapped hard with taxation? Told we're sitting on money, and now we have to go to the IMF for a paltry $3 billion just to stay economically afloat. We're promised an economic heaven. That economy is now grinding in the dirt. Shall we wail in lamentation? Hit the streets to demonstrate our consternation? While all these are okay, I know we would be much better off if the purported big economic brains handling our economy woke up, rose to the challenge, and got us out of this economic hellhole. I do not know whether our vice president himself still believes in the things he said about this administration's economic management team, but every step of the way, this administration has given credence to the skeptics, and the big talk of those in power has proven to be no more than the vain platitudes of con artists and scam operators. Yes, we the people are smart, but we got outsmarted on this one. The solid economic management team has vaporized on us, and all our hopes have gone up in smoke. Poof, just like that. Just next door, the Ivory Coast is doing magic with its economy. Our president is good friends with Monsieur Watara. He could take a leaf from his economic management book and learn a thing or two. After all, if you do not know something or if some, someone consistently fares better than you, there should be no shame in asking for lessons so you too can be better. 
I'm sad to say this, Ghana, for, but truth be told, Ghana is fast turning into an economic disaster of a country in which to live. Quite curiously, the very words copiously spewed back then by the very people who today have gone mute are coming home to roost like chickens to haunt them. There is a trending video of Mr. President saying years ago that our city was weak and weightless. Hata hata, like we say in P. If our currency was that feckless then and not able to stand on its feet, its feet, please help me out, Mr. President. How would we possibly depict it now? It must in the least be in some sort of coma with the way things are going. It must be in a vegetative state. I also recall how Vice President Baumi on October 12, 2020, almost two years ago exactly, boasted about how his government had changed the trajectory of the CD as inherited from the former administration, stating this was why the exchange rate had only moved from four CDs to the dollar to 5.8 CDs to the dollar at the time. He went on to say, if the NBC had been in power, the rate would have moved from 4.2 CDs uh, to the dollar to 16 CDs to the dollar in a matter of eight years. Well, here we are, and in just six years, the rate has moved under the brilliant economic management team of the MPP from about four CDs to the dollar to almost 12 CDs to the dollar. In fact, in January 2017, when President Okofuada and Dr. Baumia took over the management of our economy, the CD traded at four CDs 25 to the dollar. Only six years on, that has almost tripled to 11.62 CDs to the dollar as of yesterday. Some economic watchers even fear we could hit 15 CDs to a single dollar by end of year. What a sticky situation to be in. What an unbridled mess this makes a th of things for everybody. I guess that saying about being careful, even when what you wish upon your enemies is true. You just might fall into the pit you dig for them or wish them to fall into. I also remember clearly how our president, while in opposition, taunted the Mills Mahama administration. In one of his rallies, he said, and I quote, in the time of Kufu, one dollar, one CD. In the times of Mills and Mahama, two CDs, one dollar. If I were they, I would say to the people of Ghana that I am sorry. We are sorry for the poor work we have done. We are going to go and think about ourselves. But that is not the people we're dealing with. The fruits of office, the money under the table has become sweet for them, so they are determined to stay. Are we going to allow that to happen? In Kufour's time, one of the people who advised and helped him to develop a strong city was my running mate, Mohamedou Baumia. Then he was the deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana. It is one of the reasons I have brought him to come and join me, that we will work on the city and create, a, again, a strong city that will be able to allow us to develop our, our economy. We have told the world that under our leadership, we are going to turn our backs on the old economy, the raw material exporting economy, and build a new industrial value-adding economy in our country that will bring jobs for our people, and especially for the young people of our country. That is the goal of the MPP government, the administration of Nana Adodankwe Kufuadu. End of quote. Those are not my words. They are the words of our president, Nana Adodankwe Kufuadu, just a few years ago, when his thirst for power was at its peak. Did he mean them when he uttered those words? I cannot say. This I can say for sure, though. Today, the president sings from a very different hymn sheet. Looking back, though, listening to himself, reflecting on all these things he said, and now pondering what his administration has done while in power, I sometimes wonder how our president can sleep at night. I honestly do. It's so sickening. The worst part for me is how this has led to such mistrust among young people that they are either apathetic to the possibility of ever getting the right leadership or pessimistic about any real positive change ever being brought to bear. Either way, that is a very dangerous slope on which to leave our youth. But can I fault them when grown men and women have given up on our system? Can I? A story was shared with me about how someone who had over $200,000 in his bank account wanted a chunk of that just a few days ago, but the bank couldn't get anything above 1% of that, the equivalent of $2,000 for him. What? His own money, oh, his own money. We were very recently told the 750 million Afrexim bank facility would cause the dollar to plummet against the city to the point where it wouldn't be worth holding on to the American greenback. Omaya is city. Today, the dollar is pegged at 11 CD 62. Again, we're being told the Coco syndicated loan of $1.2 billion will turn things around. I, for one, am not holding my breath. There has been too much deceit, too much inconsistency, too many failed promises, and far too many non-performing policies for me to take any of such rhetoric seriously. To make matters worse, the International Monetary Fund is warning developing countries such as Ghana to be careful when using monetary policy tools to control inflation. 
The IMF argues that over-hiking policy rates could lead to difficult economic moments for citizens, while low policy rates could also cause economic stagnation and a recession. This, dear friends, is looking like an uphill task every which way you turn or look. Depending on where you bank, if you're on a, a facility like I am, you may have noticed a hike in the rate of interest you have had to pay over the last few months. If you're not in a facility already, we all know the rates are cutthroat now. And if you were compelled to go for a loan, even as our government continues to crowd out the private sector by falling so heavily on loans from our local banks, it would cost you more than just an arm and a leg. The bank would probably take an, another limb for good measure. And where does that leave the ordinary man but buried under the rubble of economic hardship? And all what this hardship is doing is spawn more and more criminality. Fraudsters are on the rampage. In fact, just a few days ago, a colleague from right here at work got a call and suspected it was a fraudster, so he called me to listen into the conversation. The scary thing was that the scam message had come from my colleague's bank's own text system on which it communicates with this person. I advised he tell the person he would go to the bank to give the text message code details this person was requesting and the person hang up immediately. That is how bad it's gone. Before I end, I would like us to take a snapshot of our economic situation, the hole into which we have dug ourselves with our fiscal recklessness. Here we go. Just walk with me. This is all on the galloping inflationary rates. And look at it. Inflation is now at 37.2%, from 33.9% in August. And of course, that means that's an increment of 3.3%. Food inflation stands at 37.8%. Non-food inflation at 36%. 0.8%. Follow me. When you look at the trajectory, look at where we were on the 1st of January, 13.9%. It escalated to 23.6% in April. Now it stands at 37.2%. 37.2%. That's an addition of over 23%, 20, about 23.3%. Then you look at the breakdown. Inflation for imported items is at 40.7%, and then the inflation for domestic items is at 35.8% per the Ghana Statistical Service. Of course, if you hit the market, depending on what you're getting, things may be a little different. But look at the regional breakdown. Depending on where you are in our country, if you look at the more green belt or the, the shade, that shade of green, both of them look cyan. But you would be looking at 25% here, representing communities like the Upper West, uh, the Northern region. Then the cyan color, Buno East, around 28.5%, getting to the 30%. And then curry, leading to the orange colored, 35%. 40% is getting disastrous at this point, and 45%. Now you would notice the central region, 41.9%, is right on, on, on this belt. And then in the Eastern and Greater Accra regions, 45%. So especially in the Greater Accra region, you just see how this will impact the cost of living. 45.3%. The breakdown, I wouldn't go through all of them, but look at water, where it's shot up to. Now we're buying sachet water for 50 pesos. 58.9%. If you're thinking of cereals and cereal products, 46%. Fish and other seafood, 44.5%. If you are the kind that goes for plant products, infusions, tea, mate, it's shot up by at least 40%. Oils and fats, 39%. Then, ready-made food and other products that you get right off the top, 36.7%. Overall food inflation, of course, at 37.8%. Cocoa drinks, in our own country, we produce cocoa, 25.5%. Vegetables, tubers, plantains, and the rest, look at the hike, over 20%. But come with me, let's look at this trajectory. It paints a certain picture. You would realize that they... The inflationary rate has always been beneath the policy rate, the monetary policy rate of the Bank of Ghana. But look at what interesting bit happens. Right from February 2022, the second month of the year, it went higher, 15.7% to 14.5%. Some feel that is exactly when we should have started doing something about our monetary, uh, you know, our monetary policy rate. But we waited. And now the divergence kept going on, 19.4% to 17%. And now look at where it is. Uh, our monetary policy rate has been hiked by 250 basis points to 22. But look at where the inflationary rate is, 37.2. Look at the gap, and you'll see what we have to grapple with. In terms of debt restructuring and its effect on pension schemes, we bring this up for a reason. About 94%, representing about 3.7 billion Ghana cities of the 3.9 billion Tier 2 pensions. You contribute to Tier 2, pay attention. 
These contributions placed in government securities may be affected by a probable debt restructuring program. Why? A debt restructuring will mean the yield to maturity of government bonds and bills will be extended, or better still, the haircut policy enforced. And that would mean if an asset such as the holdings of a particular government bond is worth 1 million Ghana CDs, given a 20% haircut, you would just be looking at getting 800,000 CDs, no longer the 1 million you put in. Even risk-free investments are now risky in this country. So almost the entire pension funds of Tier 2 contributors have been invested in the government of Ghana instruments, particularly bonds. This is because government securities are classified essentially as risk-free. But like we said, even the risk-free is now risky. According to the IMF, domestic debt is often held predominantly by domestic creditors who will suffer losses. Sovereign debt distress can easily spread to domestic banks, pension funds, that's what we're talking about, households and other parts of the domestic economy. And this can worsen the economic malaise that made the debt restructuring necessary in the first place. So looking at our sovereign domestic debt restructuring, restructuring domestic debt is like surgery. You only do it if you must, and you avoid it if it might do more harm than good. Where we are, I guess our hands are tied. And if we decide to go on a haircut spree with our pension schemes, God help us. God help us. The cookie is crumbling. I pray, even as we work, that we can salvage our economy because the doors on which we are knocking now, God help us. My name is Benjamin Akako. These are my blunt thoughts served to you raw, hot, and edited, and diluted on another Friday morning. God richly bless Ghana. Well, here we are as we talk about the state of our economy with a focus on the inflationary rate and what the latest dynamics moving from 33.9% in August to 37.2% in September. What does all of that mean? We analyze the numbers with Seth Tekwe, former finance minister. But let me come into the studio first. Bernice Abubedu Lanza is here with us. A very good morning to Hello, you. Hello, good morning to you. How are you doing? I'm okay. It's a Friday. Yes. The week is ending without ending. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, great to have you here this morning as we discuss this very important subject matter because uh, this matters to everybody, no matter where you are on the status ladder. Mm. Inflation hits everybody Bread and butter in different issues. ways. And so this is an important subject to discuss. And we have the right people to help us do that. We also have joining the conversation Professor Lord Mensah, Finance Lecturer, University of Ghana Business School, and Professor John Gachi, Dean, UCC School of Business. Gentlemen, a very good morning uh, to you. I just want to cross-check whom we have right now. Right, everybody's on. Everybody's on. Okay, so I see uh, Mr. Tekwe in there. There's also Professor Lord Mensah and Professor Gachi. I want to start, uh, Mr. Tekwe, from the standpoint of those uh, changes. So before we even get into the inflationary rate, we know the reference year has changed to 2021 uh, as more data is collected and inflation is being driven by surging input costs and the slumping uh, city. But this bit about the reference year changing to 2021, <coughs> uh, what does it really mean? What is your understanding of that? Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, good morning to your viewers and uh, others who may be listening. Uh, it simply means that, you know, the weight or the weight that is given to the various components, um, uh, food, non-food, alcohol, and the rest, they are normally given weights. And so you see the categorization. That weight changes. And the reason it normally changes. In other words, um, one weight may be, it used to be food you know, which for a long time may have seen 50%, you know, as services become dominant in the economy. It's similar to the rebasing of the GDP that we, we are also familiar with. So as the economy changes and trends, you know, uh, in the economy change, uh, then the weights are normally revised, you know, by Ghana statistical service, which there's most of this. So you may see one weight becoming heavier than another one, and it reflects you normally, in the case of inflation, you know, the, 
uh, contributions which this makes to the um, <clears throat> to the headline inflation that is that is given. Uh, I think in, in your analysis, you were also looking at regional spread. You were looking at, you know, specific, you know, um, <clears throat> specific products or services, you know, and how they also vary in relation to, you know, the average. Uh, and so that is how I would um, explain it simply. Uh, the academics can also come in. All right. Uh, but if I may, you also mentioned uh, another significant you know, uh, and, and the changes of the basis is significant because then uh, you may be comparing one way or the other apples with oranges if you go back and you say inflation is so so and so. Uh, the weights that was in the previous uh, year base, that is 2018, it was as recent as 2018, right. and uh, the previous one went back, further back. So the weights have changed, and therefore, if you are comparing food, you know, uh, price indices, they may not be exactly comparable. But the important thing is that the trend is still upward. <laughs> Whether you right. take the old basis or the new, new basis, is still is still upward. And mm. so, and that is a concern, you know, which which we should have. Um, okay. Uh, so that is unless you want me to to continue. No, I think for now that that will suffice because I want us to take it apart bit by bit before we get into the the nitty gritty. But uh, for you, Professor Mensa, we also know that the, the government statistician has, uh, like uh, Mr. Tekwe is saying, there have been some changes and he has announced, uh, he announced yesterday that the weighting in the regions as well is changing, even from the 10 to now the 16 and a further breakdown. Uh, what would explain this, this splitting uh, even further? Like you saw me do the regional breakdown, we can see that some of the regions are performing uh, averagely, but others like the, the greater Accra region, the central region, the, the, the eastern region are way up there. And now in the eastern region, for example, it's about 47.3% thereabouts. What does that mean? Well, uh, good morning and good morning to our viewers. Um, the weightings uh, brings about certain uh, kind of um, heterogeneity, if I say, uh, differentials in terms of economic activities, in terms of population, in terms of consumption. So if you look at the new regions that have been formed, right? So for instance, you take the uh, Western region, we have the old weight, which it used to be 9.2. And then the new region, the new north, Western north, I mean, if you split it, you have um, Western and then Western north. That means that the Western has more economic activities in terms of population and all those. So that is carrying about um, uh, 7.3. And then when you take uh, the Western North, which is less of economic activity, it's more or less like uh, 1.9. So when you put the two together, it will give you the old weight. So the weightings more or less brings down the various economic activities. Us, you know, um, we, we're looking at inflation. Now, effectively, the regional, you know, dimensions of um, inflation clearly depicts exactly what is happening at the region in terms of consumption. I mean, okay. so when you take food, transportation, and all those. So, I mean, Accra will always lead because Accra, more people consume transport service compared to the other regions, and possibly followed by Kumasi and all those. Mm -hmm. So the numbers reflect the economic activities that happens in those regions. And then when you take, for instance, the Bravo, you know, the Bravo, where the old weight used to be seven, you know, but now Brown Apple has been split into two. So we have a half for Bono and then Bono East, which the seven needs to be spread among the three. So you realize that the seven, you have Bono taking about 3.5. So that means that the Bono carries more of economic activity in terms of consumption and then in terms of uh, price reactions than all the other regions. So clearly, uh, the weightings have to do with, you know, the various uh, economic breakdowns. But then... Um, where the inflation numbers that we see, as you can clearly see down there, eastern region is topping. Um, now, eastern region's inflation is more or less a transmission from uh, Accra because it's, it's, it's kind of um, a neighboring region where uh, most of the things that happens in Accra prop, uh, mostly spill over to um, that region. So I'm not surprised eastern region is more or less topping the regional you know, breakdowns. But, I mean, they are all reflections of the happenings in the economic activity. But if you look at, you know, um, uh, the general, I mean, inflation, 
Mm. I mean, we are increasing. That which also sends um, a signal that is not I mean, positive to um, Ghanaians. All right. Uh I'll bring in Professor Gachi, and then Bernice will take it from there because we have a, you know, quite a bit of questioning that we want you to address. But when you look at the chart that, that, that is on your TV screens right now, you would notice, Professor Gachi, that interestingly, the Ashanti region, look, look, look at inflation there, 31.1%. But in the greater Accra region, you are talking 45.3%. In fact, in that belt, we have two regions, the eastern and the greater Accra, and right following them, the central region not surprisingly, with 41.9%. But why is the eastern region at 47.1%? That, that's what some people cannot understand. The cost of living and everything. It, it's not the center of, you know, uh, practically everything. It's concentrated in Accra. Yet things are more expensive in the eastern region. Any reason why? Any reason? Well, uh, thank you. I think before I come to that, I want to make a quick comment on the change in the base period. Uh, and that has implication. Uh, if you look at it from price relative point of view, uh, you, you realize that that will fit into why some people believe that the inflation rate we are talking about is not reflective. Uh, mm. Take it that uh, the base period of uh, 2018 a price of an item, I'm losing price relative, right. is 10 CDs. Mm -hmm. uh, and the price now, uh, 2022, uh, let's say is 50 CDs. Mm -hmm. But the price in 2020, uh, 2021, for example, uh, is, let's say, 25 CDs. Uh, 25 CDs. So you, you realize that the movement from the base period 18 to right to this would have been higher. So it's like uh, changing the base period within a short period of time. Of course, I believe the minimum period for them is five years, shows that we are accommodating price development. OK. So that is one impression I believe we need to get clear. And as to why the Saskatchewan think that they need to change the base period, there are factors that should be present before you change the base period. As to whether all those factors are present before they are changing the base period. And what uh, particular uh, economic goal they want to achieve, that has not been articulated. So I think that's something we need to... Yeah, and, and I want us to quickly look at that. I was going to ask, so from where you sit, was it justified, this latest adjustment? And what could be the economic rationalization of it at this point in time? Is it to, is it to slow down the inflation? Is it to create a certain picture? that inflation isn't as high as it is, school us. Of course, as I explained, if we were not to change the base period, inflation would be much higher than what we have seen. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why do you choose to do, change the base period? What do you want to achieve? That should be part of the communique from the statistical service, and that should not be me trying to give reason. But, but what would be the reason you could give? Of course, uh, normally when price volatility is, uh, is too much to, be, uh, to bear by the economy uh, over a certain period of time, and you want to ensure that economic indicators are reflective of the true price changes and dynamics within the economy, that is when you do that. So the point I'm making is there is always an economic argument to change the base period. The economic argument has not been made by the statistical service, and that should be questioned. Right. Mm. And uh, I'm not in position to explain uh, that because of the proximity of uh, Eastern region, that is why uh, the inflation rate uh, is taking some chunk transmission from Accra, because there are many other uh, there are two other or three other regions which are approximate to uh, Accra. So why is it that their inflation is not at the level of uh, uh, Eastern region? So these are things that the Statistical Service should do and inform the public. So you don't just uh, put these figures and they keep all of us struggling. So they have done the study and provided a picture that Eastern region uh, even <laughs> looking at all the traditional regions that have been posting high inflation figures, are no more posting infl high inflation figures. What is the reason? 
That is a job that the statistical service to tell us to know what is strange thing is happening in Eastern region. It's not for us to be struggling to, <laughs> to, 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 to be providing reasons. Mm. Right, Prof. So the IMF this week uh, announced that we should expect the worst in 2023. In fact, they say that 2023 for many people will feel like a recession. So, I mean, yes, guess what people say? Well, we understand that there are global happenings that will affect a local economy like Ghana. But they argue that it is decisions and policies by our government which will ensure that these shocks do not hit us hard. So how do we handle this? Because there are many people who fear. We have done stories focusing on people's livelihoods and the standard of living. And there are those who are skipping meals already, you know, because of the high cost of living nowadays. So how do we handle this inflation uh, rise that we are seeing lately? Well, thank you. I think uh, handling the inflation uh, development is quite simple, but not immediate. Uh, quite simple because the Saskatchewan Civil for Santana have been disaggregating the data and it is very clear to us most of our staples are receiving high price development. So that is what we should be targeting. What do we do to scale up production uh, in the staple food areas? In fact, just as the IMF said, and that's what we have been saying over and over when we were talking about Ukraine and the rest, and we were making the point that if we were to scale our production of wheat in the north, if we were to diversify the production of bread, bread from potato and cassava, as the case is scientifically shown, we wouldn't be feeling the effect of the Ukraine crisis. So it's a policy issue. So policies should be designed to address the production of those food items internally. And if that is done, I believe we can contain inflation and the global effect of what the IMF talks about mm. may be accommodated by us better than other countries. Right. Let me bring Mr. Tekpe in here. Uh, Mr. Tekpe, last month, the central bank increased inflation rate uh, to a record high 22%, uh, among other uh, measures to help deal with inflation and, and boost the economy. Um, like Professor Gachi has said, some of these decisions may not yield immediate results. First, what is your assessment of the central bank's decision uh, to increase the, uh, uh, the, the benchmark interest rate? And how do you think it will impact the inflation figures we are seeing now? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, if I may bring another policy point quickly uh, on what Professor Gachi has already said, you will see that when you look at our uh, distribution by products, imported inflation, is, uh, is highest. It is 40.7% uh, mm. compared to you know, food and non-food, you know, which are 37.8 and then 36.8. And this may also be part of policy decisions like the uh, benchmark that reduced the value on which imports are calculated, and which is therefore, you know, putting a lot of pressure on domestic production, you know, because imported food becomes you know, cheaper. Uh, so we have to start looking at some of, mm. you know, those domestic policies. So another reflection is the loss of reserves. BOG is losing, you know, significant, you know, reserves. As the, and let me then come to the fiscal, as the fiscal situation deteriorates, and you can see that BOG is under pressure, not just from the reserves, but also from the fact that they are financing the deficit. If you take the media review, which is the last data we have, statistics we have, um, 22 uh, billion Ghana cities out of the 37 billion deficit is financed by DOG. You can see a country that moved from zero financing in 2016 and then went to 10 billion, you know, in 2020 uh, under the uh, pretext of, uh, uh, or the reason given was COVID. You know, now BOG is financing to test of the budget. That's what it means, uh, approximately 22 over 37, you know, the deficit. Uh, that is deficit financing. I think we've been having that, you know. So BOG, uh, which one of its mandates um, in the constitution, the two main ones are, you know, facilitating growth, but also controlling, 
you know, inflation or prices in the economy. And one of the tools that it uses to achieve this, you know, and also to make sure that it's, it's a quasi-fiscal act, it's reflective of what is going in the economy, is a policy rate. You know, so uh, it is a tool with which it is vested globally. It's a tool which they are also, which are also you know, uh, vested in central banks. And another effect of this uh, external effect is that globally, all central banks, particularly the major ones that did quantitative or flooded them, you know, the markets with a lot of, you know, credit by buying securities, are now winding that up and they are also increasing interest rate. And that means that at a time when our borrowing from outside to support the budget is virtually cut, if we were to go back, we are also going to be borrowing at a higher rate. So you can see the number of factors which, you know, a monetary policy committee, just have mentioned just a few, is looking at. They are seeing inflation going up. Their mandate is to try, you know, minimize that, you know. Uh, they are seeing loss of reserves transmitting into, you know, currency, you know, devaluation, which is a factor in the import, you know, uh, prices be the highest, you know, and they have to combat that. They are losing reserves and their preparation uh, may be quite tricky. In, in actual, but the consequence of that is that as they increase the, the policy rate, it affects other market rates. You know, first of all, they are financing and they're financing from the banks. Because what they are assuming they were not printing, then what they are finance, what they are using to finance is reserves and others which you know they have mobilized from the same banks. Uh, it deprives private sector. So the government activity, the fiscal which I'm explaining, I've just explained, you know, is bringing the banking sector very actively and government into the market. If the interest rates go up, it will worsen the case for the private sector. Mm. You know, so that's another thing with BOG because their own interest rates increase and what the banks are seeing by lending to government means that, you know, less money is going to the private sector and the private sector is, you know, is also now going to be paying high interest rates, including the government itself, you know. Um, so if I may, last point uh, before I yield, um, what you also, we also, the concern we have now is debt. And BOG will be looking critically because we're talking about BOG here. The Ministry of Finance will also be looking critically because if the city keeps depreciating as it is, then the dollar component of the debt, when converted to cities, you know, could also, you know, be high, right? So it depends on the relationship between the city and the dollar. So mm -hmm. BOG Monetary Policy Committee looks at, you know, all these, you know, factors. And they have been under pressure for some time now, you know, to be financing the deficits. Mm -hmm. And uh, this will be very critical in the uh, discussions with the IMF that is ongoing. So the IMF statement, reflects globally and global developments, as Professor Dachi has said, uh, Ukraine, uh, as I've added, interest rates, uh, other, other factors, you know, so they are talking globally. And what is meant by countries should look inward at their policies is precisely some of the reasons which I have given, which mm. we would have to convince the fund going to an IMF program, you know, that uh, this yeah. will not continue yeah. to worsen the Ghanaian situation. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I'll come back to you for more on the IMF program, but let me go to uh, Professor Lord Mensah now. So um, it, it's interesting that the IMF we are looking to for support to help in stabilizing our economy is saying that, look, next year is going to be <laughs> worse. In fact, there's a downward revision of the global growth rate for 2023. It's now 27 point, uh, sorry, 2.7 percent. And... This is a, a downward revision from, from this year, we forecast 3.2%. Do you get a sense that the IMF may be preparing the minds of citizens of countries that are coming to it for support to that, look, it's not, it's not just going to be a snap in the finger, that even though we're going to give you the, the bailouts that you're requesting, um, it may not be a, a ride in the park for you. And this is to you, uh, uh, Professor Lord Mensah. Yes, indeed. Um, they're sending a signal to, I mean, potential IMF visitors, and Ghana is one of them. And clearly, most of these countries that are going to IMF must position themselves for a program. 
And positioning yourself for a program means that the usual way of doing your things. I mean, when a situation where you read budget and you, 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 you look at a budget deficit of about 33 billion and over, uh, may not be no more because um, government may not have that free space to spend as expected. So effectively, that is more or less a pressure which um, a lot of citizens are going to have a pain to that. But then in, on the other hand, it's, it's also on a good side because um, it's a form of economic restructuring. I mean, where the aggressive way of managing economy and then driving the economy to a point where our debt has grown to unmanageable situation. Um, with the IMF, I think uh, preparing yourself for IMF, I think will keep us in line and then bring our, you know, budget, you know, deficit to a target where we can easily, you know, manage. So effectively, um, it is a good uh, thing. But at the end of the day, we may have to look at, I mean, the IMF itself and what it stands for. Because um, for me, for IMF to come out and say that the next year is going to be a difficult year for countries like Ghana, uh, I question, you know, what it stands for. Because... From where I sit, IMF is more or less an insurance. And you know very well that um, if any country is in trouble, they will fall back to you know, IMF in case, I mean, they are part of the fund. And being you know, more or less um, an insurer, I think if, if things are not going well, you may have to come up, I mean, to indicate. And I know they have country reps here and there. Why would you watch countries to borrow to a level where they cannot manage? And, I ask myself so many questions, whether the IMF may want countries to be in trouble so that they create jobs for themselves or uh, possibly um, without, you know, developing countries being in trouble and coming back to them to borrow, uh, they may not, you know, be active as expected. Prof, a, a, so a, quick, question, a quick intervention. I, so, I, uh, Professor Mensah, a quick intervention. We know that, yes, with the IMF, it's mostly... mostly developing countries that are on board. Usually you wouldn't find, uh, you know, the developed entities with them. I think the UK, for example, it was in the 1970s or 80s, the last time they went in there, and they were quickly out. But, but the point you make about creating jobs for themselves, whose fault would it be? The IMF uh, or these developing countries like Ghana, which okay, break so their fiscal you, balance? Let me give it, you, it is not let their me give fault, you. is it? Let me give you an analogy to this. You see, when you take up an insurance, you pay a premium, isn't it? You so Ghana is part of the fund. So we pay, we contribute to the fund. And knowing very well that in case of difficulty, we may fall on that fund. But then um, the fund manager, or sorry, the insurer, what do they do? If you take a house, you know, uh, what do you call it? A fire insurance. You know, usually they, they allow you to put some mechanisms in place. If you take up, you know, motor insurance, what do they do? They make sure that you have driver's licenses, you are, you are prepared to drive. They won't give the licenses to anybody at all. And even to the extent that they may have to monitor, you know, consistently to see whether you are doing the right thing or not. IMF has country representatives. When we exited IMF uh, somewhere 2018 thereabout, and we started, you know, ballooning our expenditure, getting to a point where we cannot manage now. That is increasing our debt. Um, what did they say? They didn't say anything. To some extent, they, they were praising government of the day. Now you come back to tell Ghanaians that we should, you should brace ourselves for you know, next year. And everybody knows that next year is not going to be a normal year because it's, an, it's a year that government is going to squeeze itself to ensure that they spend within the limits that they can manage. So um, for me, uh, sometimes uh, I question what they stand for. And like I said, um, countries being in trouble, it's more or less a way of creating jobs for them. And that is why possibly they may watch government, you know, do whatever they want, get to, get to a point where they will come back to IMF. So, so, me... so is this some sort of, burn is my apologies, is this some sort of vicious cycle that is at the top of which we have the Bretton Woods institutions, in this case, the IMF? In other words, is this intentional? And in this instance, have they failed down? Yeah, they do. I mean, we were here when government started spending unnecessarily. Government, you know, um, started giving freebies during COVID, thinking it would have ended somewhere September in that year. And by extension, 
we went into wait till somewhere into the election. And we've been complaining about, you know, um, overspending in elections. So, I mean, if you watch government to spend in that manner, I know it very well that overspending will call for borrowing. And the borrowing ones, I mean, it gets to a point, the country will become distressed. Obviously, you should come in and then prompt the government that, look, what you are doing, how long would it take to send out information or send out a signal to the finance minister that the aggressive nature of, you know, um, your economic management can put us into trouble? Prof, you wait for the mm. country to be in trouble before they come to you. So that's where my problem is. P permit, me, permit me to do this, Prof. So the, the IMF is an institution. Ghana is a sovereign nation. You're talking about a certain advice. That's the best they can do. They cannot squeeze the finance minister or the government of the day to, to heed that advice. Also, they do not come to us to suggest that we should I'm come not, to I'm not no, saying prof, I'm, 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 the government. I'm making a point, the government please. To hate I'm not to saying that's advice. what you're saying, Prof. Please permit yes. me. Please permit me. So, um, again, it is our decision to go to the IMF. And I, I'm right. saying this because of uh, the, the, the impression being created that, well, they may be sitting aloof just so that they could give themselves jobs to do. Shouldn't this be squarely the fault of our leaders? And I, and I know that in, in, in the past, for example, the World Bank rep in Ghana has had reason to complain about some of the policies of government. Yeah, the, the, leader, the leaders themselves have, you know, uh, they have their share of the blame. And... Uh, I'm not dissociating them from, I mean, the blame. But then, I, 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 like I say, I'm saying, the external institution, like, I mean, um, IMF, they, because consistently they come out and it's like, oh, government is doing well. Government is doing well. But then a government that is doing well, how come, I mean, going into next year, you are more or less sending a signal that the people should brace themselves for an austere or possibly a difficult time ahead. So, Maybe. I mean, it's like, yeah. Watching government and when things get bad, that is when you come and give the people the signal. That, and we all know that looking at what is on the ground, you know, effectively going forward, things are not going to be the same. Mm. Because this is a government that has gone to a point where you cannot finance from the euro bond market anymore. Because if you look at uh, the rate at which our exchange rate is, is moving, it tells you that it's the I mean, euro bond that we've been getting that has been cushioning us. Because all the other loans that we get to cushion our exchange rate has come in this year. We've gotten the proposed syndicated loan. To some extent, we have this uh, Afro-Exchange Bank loan. Um, effectively, the only one that is not that has not come in is the euro bond, you know, um, that we normally mm. visit. Mm. And clearly, that is what is pushing, you know. But let me also tell you one thing. If you break down those who demand, you know, the dollar, you know, on the market, we have the government, we have businesses, and then we have individuals. The government is the biggest demander of the, of the, of the dollar. And if you, 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 you fail to visit the euro bond market to raise money to offset your dollar obligations, you may have to, the government is now looking at the local market. And that is why there's pressure. And mm. if it continues that way, we will deplete our buffers. And that is why our buffer has depleted to only 2.6 months or so, when it used to be around 4.3 months. So, I mean, the bigger demand of the dollar is on the market here to raise money, to, to satisfy its interest mm. obligations this year. Mm. And that is why we keep on having the dollar going up unnecessarily. Right, Prof. Now, let, me, let me just say, maybe uh, Benjamin's interview with the IMF boss can, can help clear things here. Well, she, she says that what we're experiencing in Ghana is not a, as a result of bad policies, but uh, due to external events like the Russia-Ukraine war. Let me bring in Mr. Tech, because you have been a finance minister before. Share your experience with us. Maybe the IMF doesn't come out openly to, to hint at some of these things that government, government does. Tell us what your experience was. Do you have That's them? That's why I'm saying they are part of the problem. <laughs> 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 Mr. Tech, do you have the IMF rep in Ghana, for example, walk into your office, have a meeting, discuss some of these things? Just tell us how it happens. Well, thank you very much. Um, the main indicator which the IMF uses to advise countries when the country is not in a program, which is why it is immaterial whether you are in a program or not, is Article 4. The difference 
The difference is that in a program, you have benchmarks to meet, and you have told the fund that you are going to meet those benchmarks. Secondly, unlike the COVID fund, and I'll come back to that, unlike the COVID fund and the SDR, which came from the IM, which were given to us a lump sum, when you are in a program, the assistance is given in tranches. And the condition for satisfying a tranche is that you must perform. And that is why when a country is under an IMF program, it tends to perform. And it's the other reason why the IMF is hated in developing countries, um, with all due respect, hated in quote, uh, in developing countries is the one word conditionalities. Because remember, the IMF, I would say, is an insurer, yes, but it is also a lender. Just like a is lending to government. IMF as a central bank for developing countries is a lender. And it must make sure that you they are... They make money. Uh, yes, of course they make money. Just as our central bank makes money. That's <laughs> the only reason they can build a trust hospital and others. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Uh, but let me... But they, they, so they, must, so, they must be in business. <laughs> okay, probably. Let me, let, me, let me not. So the, the point I'm making is uh, you are right. You are a sovereign country, right? Of course, the vote depends on your quota. But in terms of diplomacy, they will treat you the same way. And therefore, they will say that their you know, request to, for assistance is demand-driven. That's the expression that is used in the fund. You know, it's demand-driven. Uh, let me point out that we have a lot to do uh, in terms of we also mature. Again, I don't mean it in derogatory terms, I'm being careful, uh, so it doesn't divert from the discussions. Uh, and let me give you one example. When we entered the fund program in 2015, <clears throat> if you recall by 2013, from 2013 through 2014, the PRMA was in place. And we put in the homegrown policy that we were bent on going ahead with a sinking fund because we want to make sure that when we borrow, we can pay gradually over time so that we can become debt sustainable. We had a stabilization fund out of the experience of the uh, developed and other you know, developing economies, which economies will call the counter cyclical measures that you have to take. We put this on the table. In fact, the fund's question at the time was, wouldn't you want to give priority to the deficit out of coming out of a uh, uh, single spine, doom so borrowing, remember, for which we did ESLA, without prompting from the fund, we did it internally, ESLA was internal. We did it, went to parliament, and informed them. We said, yes, they want to balance the budget, the theme of the 2015 budget. We don't want to focus on deficit, which would only balloon the debt. We also want to use, you know, those sinking fund and other resources to manage debt. They respected it. In fact, at one point, you know, it was like looking critically at the deficit and uh, some money was about to be taken from the sinking fund. We said, no, you have to go to parliament to do that. As a result of which, we succeeded in reducing the rate of borrowing. We used 550 million US dollars of our own money mm. to pay up fair sovereign bond. And then to refinance domestic bonds, which we kept rolling over, right? These experiences. And these are things with countries that have wind themselves up the IMF in real terms, you know, have been doing. You can talk about the Asian Tigers. You can talk about the Latin American countries, the Colombia and the rest. You can talk about, you know, the uh, emerging economies of the Middle East. You can talk about the countries that were... A communist without a market economy wanting to join the European Union. These are the tools that they put in place in order to manage. So my point is that Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly its middle-income countries, would have to behave like middle-income countries and put these buffers in place. We saw what the sinking fund did for us. We were able to take 250 million US dollars to tackle COVID first, right, before we even went to the fund. COVID loan and the World Bank and others. So uh, part of the blame would have to do with us. 
putting measures in place and sustaining them. With three oil fields, we never sustained you know, these problems. And I tell you, because the sinking fund is depleted, the stabilization fund is depleted because even with three oil fields, and even when we're getting six billion, let's not forget, three billion of which came from the IMF and the World Bank, the institutions we are talking about, even, you know, under the pretense of COVID and the rest. Even whilst we were getting all of this, we did not restore the cap, or we did not remove the cap on the stabilization fund, and we kept depleting it. So if you put that in the context of our own development, the problem we are going to have is that as the fund is won, when we are hit by the next crisis, we mm. will not have those Right. You know, we, are, we will not have those buffets. Mm. And the fund as a lender, that is why the debt sustainability analysis has become the key thing, because the fund itself would not lend to a country that is bankrupt, and that is why, or near bankrupt, and that is why we are being pushed to do a restructuring of that debt, which may be a condition for finalizing the negotiations. Right. The issue of conditions of final, finalizing the negotiation, the former president, John Romani Mahama, whom you served under, is asking the IMF to make this a condition that government or the presidency cuts down on its expenditure. We've also heard from the likes of Odike, who is asking that the issue of illegal mining should be a condition. Uh, it appears that a lot of people are throwing conditions <laughs> or suggestions of conditions uh, in the way of the IMF. But do you see that we will be able to get this bailout by the end of the year as is expected by government? Well, let me put it this way. We are a country which coming out of 2019, Article 4, the fund warned us. The fund made a lot of revisions. Bailout cost, which used to be below the belt, was added. They adjusted our deficits. They adjusted our debts. We used to say this. And it starts at part of the part saying that, you know, the problem had to do with COVID. And no, we had those difficulties. If you take the Article 4 and the COVID report, it shows that our gap, fiscal gap, which is a fund, <laughs> is 3 to 5%. You know, it's in the fund report. So... It is a question for us, uh, as we speak, please. Uh, aren't our uh, suppliers who provide food for school children saying that they have not been paid? Aren't contractors saying that they have not been paid? Don't we have IPP loan, you know, which we haven't paid, despite ESLA? Don't we still have depositors who have not been paid? even though we have ESLA, which was the purpose for which we went to parliament and should have lasted three to five years. I think this question is for us. And yes, I agree with my, my boss, you know, because we put some of these things up front. Remember, we went to Senti, a consensus, and we put some of these things up front. They didn't have to, as I said, we did ESLA. It didn't have to be forced down our throat. Of course, it was real gross. It was called a nuisance tax. We went to parliament and... So I think we should begin to turn these questions, you know, for ourselves. Okay. And before my former, former, sorry, let me now, before my boss made the current statement, remember he asked for a century star consensus on the national pushing expenditure with against a stagnant revenue, right? Against a stagnant revenue, which is what is leading to the borrowing. And now our stopping of using the sinking fund to service the debt as we kept borrowing to be locked out of the external markets, right? In any event, going to the external markets to borrow, yes, and we did, that you get foreign exchange. But it, the objective should be foreign exchange. That is why we started schemes that self-financing for the dollar-based revenues that we are receiving should be paying for some of the projects which are dollar-based. So that even if you go and borrow in dollars, you should be able to you know, ring fence some of this, you know, revenue. So, um, in, in short, what I'm saying is that uh, we should, yes, the, it, it, it will come as a condition. It's immaterial whether there's but there hasn't been any of our 17 or 18 programs that we have done without expenditure management. And we are not talking about expenditure management. <clears throat> and we cannot observe those expenditures uh, when we can't even go to the markets to borrow. Right. Where are we leading? Yes. 
Uh, thanks for those important points you've made, uh, Mr. Tekbe. Just hold for us. Uh, I, I want us to look at a few things tied to the IMF, uh, since we brought up the IMF, before we segue back into uh, the, 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 the inflationary rate and what, what it's pegged at, because now we see it shooting up more than we saw from July to August. But when you look at the IMF and what it said only yesterday uh, on, on the back of our monetary policy uh, rate, they have made it clear that we have to have a balancing act. And this is for you, Professor Gachi, that we have to have a balancing act so that we don't spin off into a recession, which is something that we could get into if we don't manage things right. But when I look at the, the monetary policy rate uh, in the slides that I shared right before we came on, the one, when, when you look at September 2021, you would see that inflation was at just 10.6%, and then the policy rate at the time at 13.5. Then we get to the crucial month of February 2022, where there is that crossover. Inflation takes over from the policy rate, hitting 15.7% when the policy rate is at 14.5. And all the way from there, we have never seen a decline. Right now, it stands at 37.2, with um, the policy rate being at 22, even on the back of the latest hike in the policy rate. Are we getting it right? Are we on that slippery slope that the IMF is speaking of? And should we, in the month of February 2022, when inflation started upping the ante against uh, the policy rate, is that where we should have acted? Did we miss out? Well, thank you. I think it's very clear that the policy is not achieving its objectives. Uh, while policy rate is expected to contain inflation, the policy rate and associated policies announced by the Bank of Ghana are rather contributors to inflation. That is what you are seeing there. Wow. Now, take a situation, yes, uh, because uh, like uh, Mr. Honorable Sir Tekbe said, uh, that when you increase the policy rate, you are virtually increasing other rates in the market, and those rates are associated with uh, the private sector consumption, production, et cetera, and that will have effect in the pricing because their cost structure would have changed as a result of uh, increase in cost of access to credit. So that is what is happening. And at the same time, uh, the Bank of Ghana has also decided that uh, they were increasing the cash reserve, which means, and uh, in the environment where the, the report already indicated about 89 to 90% of lending of financial institutions, including insurance companies, pension funds, go to government. So you have virtually crowded out the private sector and make credit very costly for the private sector, even though it's not even effective. Mm. So that is what you have done over the period. So while you are reducing the ability of the financial institution to provide credit to undertake economic activities, you are hiking the rate. What you are doing virtually is to create a cost that will be translated into price development. And that is what we are seeing. So you, you're basically saying that the monetary policy, and, and, which and, is... And, and, the, and the effect is not only on price development, it's also on damping nature of growth. So when your real interest rate is continuously higher than uh, your real growth rate, what you see is what the IMF is warning about. But I also want to indicate that the IMF warning is timely because it is natural uh, that when you are preparing for a budget and economic policy, you are guided by some of these uh, global indicators so that we will be watching to see whether that global picture will be reflected in the growth forecast for 2023, uh, expenditure forecast for 2023. That is what I believe we'll be watching for. May, may I so, add a quick dimension? Um, very quick one, uh, Mr. Tekpe. Yes, quick one. In terms of BOG and the economy, remember, as I said, BOG itself was accommodating the deficit. And therefore, it gave government the opportunity not to trim expenditure, even when we all knew that the expenditure was ballooning. And as I said, this was, this was an institution which, through a memo with the Minister of Finance, was enforcing zero financing and suddenly went you know, on the binge and started you know, financing the deficit. So it is also 
part of which is inflationary, <laughs> you know, because the government is just, you know, uh, 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 spending. And, and therefore, we have not addressed the issue of expenditure. It shouldn't be, it will be an imposition from the plan, whether we demand it or not. It will mm. be, because the deficit cannot remain unsustainable. You cannot control debt without looking at your deficit and slowing down the rate of expenditure and the rate of borrowing. Mm. And that means that Bank of Ghana is likely to be a prior action that Bank of Ghana would have to contract the pace at which it is financing the deficit because it is not, it is not good for the economy. Professor Gachi, so what, what then would you propose? Should the Bank of Ghana slow down on the monetary policy hikes? Uh, what should be the next move as inflation keeps going higher? Well, I think the, the policy hike is not achieving anything except to contribute to cost development and uh, destabilize the direction of inflation. So Bank of Ghana will have to look at that again uh, because the policy objective is not being achieved. Mm. Mm, and and, and, and so, sorry, Benjamin, uh, on the question on whether this decision should have been taken earlier in February when mm. we saw uh, that the inflation uh, rates had overtaken the policy rates at the time. Uh, Prof, your response to that? Exactly so. <laughs> so action should have been taken from then, right from then? Much earlier. And, uh, yes, and I agree. I would say that we, we should have used the six billion, approximately, of uh, COVID assistance we got, including our own 250 million mm. uh, COVID funds, the COVID loan, one billion, SDR, one billion, Bank of Ghana, 1.7 billion, which is the uh, equivalent of US dollars. World Bank just told us that, you know, <laughs> they've they given Ghana more money, the current government more money right. than any government, close to a billion. So if you add all of this, million, up, right. what did we do with the six billion? We should have used it to do a correction, you know, mm. a correction by cutting, looking at the expenditure so that we create the necessary buffers. That all is going to the wind, and we are where we are now. Mm. Let, let me just bring in that mm, Professor Mensah quickly uh, before we, we look at other issues. So interestingly, the IMF is forecasting a deficit uh, by end of year of 9.2% of our GDP in 2022. But tied to this entire conversation we're having, there is also the bit about debt restructuring. Professor Mensah, we've had time to talk about it a lot. There is now the question of 94% of tier two pensions, which could be affected. And here's the bit. That would be about 3.7 billion uh, Ghana cities of the 3.9 billion tier two pension contributions placed in government securities that could be affected. And of course, we know what such a haircut uh, would mean when it comes to uh, tier two pensions. I, the, the analogy has been made that, for example, if we get a 20% haircut on about a sum of 1 million, that would mean you get 800,000. Uh, what is your take on that? What is your reflection? Is it a real possibility? SNIT has come out to say tier two pensioners should not be worried, but is it a real possibility where we are and what would it mean? Yeah, I mean, it is the possibility. Because if you look at a tier two and the kind of investment that has been earmarked for it, Clearly, they are all government-oriented investment. And if it turns out that government, you know, reduces interest rate. And let me tell you one thing. If the, if the haircut comes up, right, it's going to affect pensions. It's going to affect insurance companies. Because all the money, the premiums they are collecting and all those contributions goes into government securities. If you look at the FPRE's allocations for the kind of investment pension managers are supposed to do, about 80% are in government securities. So if it turns out that interest rates are supposed to be reduced as a result of debt restructuring, then obviously it's going to affect this investment, including the tier two that we are talking about here. So, um, and without debt restructuring, government cannot manage this debt that we are talking about, the situation we find ourselves in. Because the external, you know, um, um, inflows, which is coming as a result of the euro bond, has been frozen on us. And so, and in the local environment, interest rate has gotten to a point where if government does not find means of, you know, getting it, get busted, 
to a level where it can be managed because it has bubbled and it's still bubbling, right? So we need a, an intervention to bust it up and bring it to a point where government can manage it. And so that restructuring is imminent and it's going to be a way of, you know, positioning the economy for an IMF program. Now, the IMF will never lend to a country that is in distress because they know very well that even if they come to your rescue, whatever support they give you may go into your debt payment. So you may have to negotiate your debt before they come in. But it's unfortunate the administration is not bold enough to tell Ghanaians that we are doing self-restructuring. But rather, they want to hide behind, you know, IMF. That is why they will go to Washington before they come and announce, you know, restructuring to tell us that it's IMF who is calling for this restructuring. It's not the IMF. We may have to take a bold step to make sure that we restructure our debt to a manageable point. And that is why the five-member committee has been called in. And if you look at the composition of that five-member committee, it's cut across banks, insurance, pensions, and all those. So effectively, they know what is about to happen. But then the finance minister is managing the situation to hide behind the IMF, to give the signal that it's the IMF that is calling for so, the so in other words, it comes, in other words, so, to, to give you so, give so, you so, so just so just, just a quick top up, uh, Mr. Tekpa, so maybe you can address it, and, and Bernice will come in. So in other words, this is imminent, but I want to find out. In that debt restructuring, whether we are looking, we're narrowing it down to pensions, tier two pensions, or generally, what is then going to be the best case scenario and the worst case scenario? And I'm, I'm, I right. want us to look specifically at the pensions. What would be the end? Right. Fantastic. So the, the, the best case scenario would be that if interest rates should be reduced, you know, when the pension fund or fund managers collect these pension contributions and then they invest them. They also profit from a certain spread. So possibly they're looking at maybe uh, pension contribution and then returning maybe 20% um, um, to pension contributors. And then they invest with the government to about, let's say, 26%. Mm. So there's a spread of 6% that they are enjoying. Now, when it turns up that the haircut is within the spread, so possibly maybe 3%, then the banks at their, sorry, the pension funds at their level may be ready to absorb this, you know, um, I mean, reduction in the rate. So possibly they may not go out with a 26%, but they will go with 23% now, which is within their spread. So they can ab absorb it at the upstream level, which without maybe tickling it down to the retailing, right? Effectively, that will, you know, keep the confidence in the economy that we have. But if it turns up that, you know, the, the haircut goes beyond the spread that the banks are, sorry, the pension, you know, fund managers wants to enjoy, possibly 8%, or coming to 18%, then obviously they may, they may have to pass it on to, you know, the pension contributors. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, it's going to reduce the confidence that we have in contributing for pension. And governments, you know, ability to raise money, you know, pensions are long term. And that is where possibly we may look at you know, having kind of, you know, long-term infrastructure investment to put those monies into. So the economy in itself will have its horizon of investment coming to short term. And I wouldn't be surprised in a worst case scenario, seeing, seeing almost everybody doing, you know, 91 day, you know, treasury bill to serve as an investment. Even if they want to do one year, they may like to do, you know, 91 day rollover for four, four times, you know. So effectively, uh, they has serious economic repercussions and so that is why the engagement with the five member committee's engagement we're hoping that it will come out clear if for nothing at all between the pension fund managers between the banks who have collected people's you know investment and they have put it in the government you know business um they should be able to share the spread you know and would the bank be ready to you know i mean share the spread or maybe absorb the spread that is another question we may have to look at Mm. Well, I know that yes, in... in I, uh, but Mr. Tepe, please continue. Yes, I just want to give a very practical example okay. of a domestic restructuring. In 2015, whilst we were going through the fund, the one billion sovereign bond that we did, which was guaranteed by the World Bank, was used entirely to restructure domestic and foreign bonds. Uh, what happened? 
because we had a one billion, you know, uh, we paid off some uh, treasury bills and other bonds, the 2011, 2010 bonds that were issued to pay off the single spine, which were maturing. So we paid them off. Now, secondly, we paid off, we used 200 million to pay off part of the, the uh, first sovereign bond, which is why we had to use 550 mm. uh, million US dollars of our own money. The effect of this was that you saw treasury bill rates go down. These are the reasons why treasury bill rates went down from about 23% to about 16% by 2016 when we're leaving office. Because we didn't have to force a haircut. The government was less in the market. Government was not doing rollovers and therefore being forced you know, to pay higher interest rates, right? Then, secondly, ESLA. As a result of the debt that VRA and others had accumulated, we went to parliament. And we, crude oil prices had fallen, so we used part of the tax that was being paid to set up ESLA. And immediately, as a result of that, in the negotiations with the banks that lent to VRA, we were able to reduce the domestic debt which they had taken from about 25% to 21% and were able to reduce the standard debt of 11 to 13% down to eight, about 8.5 and 9%. And that's because we were liquid and we had the resources. But the final point about this is that we did not want those debts to pile up in the future. Mm. Again, this is where the sinking fund comes in. And so we set up the sinking fund and we assure the markets that this is constitutional. This is in the law, the Public Financial Management Act, and we're therefore going to use the sinking fund over the period of the 12 years of the World Bank debt loan, uh, guaranteed bond, pay off our external debt, in fact, up to 75% from Jubilee alone. So these were measure, practical measures that were put in place. I think when no, we, we don't have the money now. Self financing. Well, yes, because we are depleted. And that's the point. <laughs> but with three oil fields, we rather depleted, as Professor Gachi said. We depleted, you know, the bath from mm. stabilization to sinking fund, and all went into expenditure. Remember, we even debated sweeping the heritage fund to finance, you know, free SFS, free SFS. If you right. remember. Mm. Right. So I think we should go back. So this has been done. The only situation we are facing now is likely to be the Sri Lanka and other situation where we do not have those buffers, you know, to, we don't them, have them. You yeah. know, to be able to go to the next will be forced on us. a stronger position. Mm. Yes, it will. Right, gentlemen, we'll be wrapping up our conversation shortly in about 10 minutes. Uh, but let me just mention because uh, Professor Lord Mensa mentioned about people wanting to invest in treasury bills. I know that banks are struggling now. There are people who are coming in their numbers to withdraw their investments and it's causing a strain in a lot of banks. But let me come to you, Professor Gachi. We have discussed government measures and policies to address the current economic crisis we are facing. Just this week, we saw in Kumasi, business owners closing their shops, protesting the current tax regime, coupled with the current economic situation, they say it's too much for them to deal with. We've dealt with government. How do businesses position themselves to deal with the times that we are getting into, as we see the IMF predict worse times? Well, I think we need to go back to the issue of debt restructuring, uh, because uh, I'm not looking at it from just an activity going on in the market. This is a legal matter. Remember that those who bought into treasury bill and government bonds and the rest is a, is a debt contract. And the government is obliged over a period of time to pay interest and principal. Mm -hmm. Now, this same government uh, controls all the regulatory institutions. I am aware that as far back July, I guess, the regulatory institutions have started collecting data as to the amount of exposure of fund managers to government bonds and other instruments, which means there has been some preparation. Uh, there seems to be some indication that government attempted external debt restructuring arrangement, but failed. 
And the only thing left now is the domestic one. And this might be addressed in a manner that will exhume that confidence. Like you are saying, uh, a number of people are lining up to discount their treasury bill. What is the implication for that uh, going forward? Government will have to come back quickly, show transparency about the entire thing, give some indication as to where we are heading towards so that people will position themselves very well uh, in such a way that there will not be a quasar rank uh, on, on, on our financial institution in terms of demanding to discount investment. That is very crucial. And I think uh, we need to send this message very right. clearly to the government. Right. Uh, uh, Prof, I am, my question specifically was to business people who may be watching us. I mean, how do they position their businesses? What decisions do they take? You can extend uh, any advice, if you have it, to even individuals, because homes are suffering. Uh, people are struggling to meet their daily demands uh, for paying electricity, water, um, you know, uh, buying groceries, and all these very basic things that people need to survive. Well, I can only advise uh, business people to restructure their activities, look at uh, the that, cost that is... Too. Not not just government restructuring, but businesses. Oh, of course, to, you see that is a broader discussion. That's a broader <laughs> discussion we need to have. Yo. You see, those that are supposed to be the drivers of economic activities are also indebted to financial institution. Government policy and activities have actually dwarfed their uh, their significance, and that is why they are crying. When you go to the foreign exchange sector, the businesses are hit hard. When it comes to prices, hit hard. Uh, you know, everything is at odd with the business person. But that business person doesn't have that opportunity to go to financial institution to restructure. Government, who has borrowed all the money, has. So it's, it's something that we need to put in a package and discuss holistically. Right. Even when we attempt to, to succeed in this debt restructuring, there is uh, uh, some implication for regulatory reporting. What would be the overall implication for even uh, 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 non, 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 I mean, um, um, uh, 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 the regulatory requirement for uh, non-performing laws, even in the financial sector? All those things will have to be discussed broadly for us to happen. Even also, we will do all these things. Mm. And the financial institutions become impaired, they become weak. Already we do know <coughs> a number of financial institutions are weak. So as for the businesses, uh, it is very difficult to tell them what to do. They are in a very serious situation that all these discussions should be brought in to cover them. Right, Prof. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, for me, just two quick wrap-up comments, if, if you could do less than a minute, uh, each of you. It, it's for each of you as you wrap the conversation. Uh, one, we're at 37.2% when it comes to inflation. Food inflation is at 37.8%, non-food in inflation 36.8%. And then, of course, we can talk <coughs> about imported I I inflation, which is at 407 and then local, which is at 358 37.2, we are just, what, 2.8 percentage points away from 40%. Can we hit that by end of year? And when it comes to an IMF program, the Minister of Finance has given us a hard date, November 15. Now they're in Washington, D.C., you know, talking about some of these matters. Would, do you think we would get a program before the next reading of our budget? Those are my two quick questions. Uh, I'll start with you, Professor Gachi, then to Professor Mensah, and finally, Mr. Tekwe. Well, I'm not sure about getting a program by that time, because as I indicated earlier, I consider the domestic debt restructuring as a precondition to, to, to keep going. And I, I don't know how that will be uh, concluded before the 15th of November. And uh, you should also bear in mind that as a sovereign country, uh, our parliament will have to look at uh, what is contained in the IMF uh, program mm. that is agreed upon, uh, discussed and approved. Uh, all those processes are there, and I don't think that we should rush uh, unnecessarily to this, to this end. Can I inflation hit 40% by end of year? 
that is highly possible because there is what we call pass-through effect. Some of the uh, an, a policy announcements will have about three months pass-through effect. So there is that possibility that we will continue to have some increase in inflation as whether it to be marginal or a uh, very high infl uh, increase. I, I'm not in position to say, but definitely those pass-through effects will cause increase in inflation. And I am not distinguishing at this point between uh, imported inflation and food or right. domestic inflation, right. because right. in my opinion, most of the food items are now imported. So they are influenced by <laughs> imported inflation, so to say. Mm. So those are the things we need to be looking at. Gone were the day when our imported inflation is limited to intermediary goods. Okay. Uh, Professor Mensa, briefly on this one. So those two questions, very quickly, if you can. Yeah, I mean, for IMF program, I mean, before the end of the year, we are out. We won't get a program before the end of the year because um, it's like we are now preparing the grounds to accept the program. The, the IMF um, boss told me they would do everything possible to give us a program by end of year. You, so you're disputing that? No, no, that's not possible. That's not possible. Because we are now going to read budget, which is somewhere in uh, November, and the budget should really position the country for an IMF program in terms of our budget deficit, in terms of the way we want to spend, in terms of the financing of the, uh, the budget deficit from the central bank government, whether it will be reduced or not. The government should exhibit that readiness, you know, to accept the program. So okay. um, it's not going to be um, until maybe the first um, half of the ne of, of next year. Now, on the inflation, um, it all depends on the signals that our budget will send. If the, if the budget gives the signal that government has toned down, is going to tone down in borrowing, the government, uh, the, the budget gives a signal that at the end of the day, um, we're going, we are likely to go into IMF program. And as a result of that, um, possibly we may have to look at reduction in borrowing on the domestic market. Then possibly that will give that confidence to um, businesses to say that, okay, fine, we can have access to funding from the domestic market because government is not prepared to you know, borrow as it used to be. And so we can borrow and then possibly import more. And it also depends on you know, the exchange rate and how it is behaving. If the exchange rate keeps itself up there, I'm sure, I mean, investors, who are, sorry, those importers will advise themselves. And we know very well that, you know, if you take our food basket, chunk of them are imported. Then, of course, reorientation, getting into the, I mean, festive seasons will also be important because if inflation keeps on, you know, going up and interest rate keeps on going up, exchange rate, you know, keeps on going up, Obviously, Ghanaians may have to reorient themselves, you know, getting into the uh, Christmas festivities. Possibly, I mean, look at how you can consume, you know, a minimum of imported, you know, product. And that will have a way to control the inflation. So the 40%, um, it's not likely we may hit it before the end of the year. Mm. Right. Let's hear you, uh, Mr. Tekbe, on the same questions that Benjamin asked. Yes. November 15, a month away, is ambitious. And I wouldn't to repeat the, you know, debt and other issues mm. that are coming up. Mm. What I'd like to say is that the IMF is a bureaucracy. And even when you finish, finalize, they are not doing the annual meetings, they are preoccupied with it. So, and you cannot, they just came for data gathering and started the first mm. discussions. You cannot complete in a second discussion which is taking place in Washington, and then come back November 15th. Uh, once an agreement is reached, it will have to go to the Africa Department. If I may talk about process bureaucracy, Africa Department will have to, you know, review the document at the management level, their management level. That document will be circulated to all the departments in the IMF, the departments will come with their comments because remember the fiscal experts and our problem is fiscal are not in Africa. They are in the fiscal affairs department. Mm. Our monetary issues, central bank and the rest, they are not in Africa. They are in the uh, capital markets division, you know, the IMF. So they will have to comment because they are the ones who have been providing technical assistance. Once these comments are taken on board, 
Assuming there's nothing else that government endorses, it will now go to all the executive directors of the firm for their staff to prepare them for a board meeting. I don't think all of this can be done in the matter of one month. Uh, in the interest of disclosure, I work at the firm, so I'm talking about you know, what I know about processes you know, within you know, the, the IMF. So I would say let's, go, let's look for a good program, not a fast program, because our programs are deep. They need critical solutions. The World Bank Board would have to come in with budget support and other things. And they must also be, the document will go to their board for a discussion. African Development Bank would also come in. The real sector support are provided by these institutions, not the IMF. The IMF money would be for, ideally, balance of payment support. Right. So I think it is highly ambitious. As to inflation hitting 40%, inflation is about expectations, right? So and we know where the sentiments are going now. A lot of sentiments are, you know, and, and, and the market is feeding itself, you know, in terms of price increases, you know. So I do not have all the internal, how much the questions that Professor got you from the beginning, I do not have all the internal dynamics and the rest, uh, but I think it is likely, uh, or we could manage not to reach, you know, that point. Whether we reach that point or not, we are already at a 20 year plus high. And that itself is not a good record. Right. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time here this morning. Uh, Professor John Gatchi, Dean UCC School of Business, Professor Lord Mensah, a lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, and Mr. Seth Tepe, former finance minister. We wish you all the best. And they've been discussing this morning the inflation rate, which has hit 32.2, hmm. and Ghana going to the IMF, because that's directly linked to inflation is one of the ways the government program. is hoping to deal with our alien economy. So you've heard what the experts have to say. I don't know how that will inform your decision as a person on how to restructure your life because it looks like the restructuring has hit no, we must all restructure. individual levels. Yeah. And so uh, like the IMF is saying, uh, brace yourself for tougher times. But like Mr. Tekpe said, I, and I think that uh, that was uh, uh, an interesting quote Let's look for a, 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 a deep program, not a fast one. Right. So it's important that we keep that in mind. Benjamin. Well, we take a breather from here. When we return, NSMQ much later. But yeah, be peja, peja. What is that all about? We're talking that literary festival coming your way from today, Saturday, and through to Sunday. Stay. We'll bring you details of it. Welcome back. Let's talk creatives. Let's talk about literature. Yem peja, peja. Anyway, maybe they just might adopt that. Bernard Akwe Jackson is creative director of Peja Martin Egblawogbe. Dr. Martin Egblawogbe is a physicist. He actually is head of department of the physics department at the University of Ghana. He is also director of Peja. Gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Yeah, thank you very much, and I'm glad to be here with you. I see you, you started growing a uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think it's that's, from you. Actually. That's just an enlightener. So just to, I, I love it when people like Doc come into the studio because when I started, when I was cutting my teeth with my book show on radio years ago, it was Dr. Martin Egblawogbe together with Nana Fredo Ajman, yes, exactly. who were my initial guests helping out. So uh, we're glad to have you here, still on the literary front. Yes, it's, it's really exciting. I love it. So l let's talk about this literary event, Peja. T tell us a bit about it. What, what is it? Okay. So Peja is a literary festival. And uh, in essence, what it tries to do is to bring together people with a vested interest in literature, authors, academics, lovers of literature, as in books. And okay. I mean, everybody who actually is involved, like publishers as well, and bring them together for a three-day event, mm. series of events, performances, readings, book launches, and generally also to have fun. Mm -hmm. So that is what PJ is. It's been running for the past five years. We're in the sixth edition, mm -hmm. and it's going to actually open this evening at the Growth right. Institute and run from Friday to Saturday to Sunday. So it's actually three days of events that are focused entirely on literature. Mm -hmm. And we have lots of books and lots of events actually happening over the weekend. 
So in case you've never been there, I have, I think, two or three times. And trust me, when Doc says it's going to be lit, it is going to be lit. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. You know, I've been there, seen authors from the sub-region. It, it is always fantastic. But let's talk, uh, Mr. Akwe, about the headline event this evening. Okay. evening. okay. Um, the headline, I mean, Peja has always had these uh, huge headline and then tail line events. And we've sought to uh, engage prominent uh, players in the industry or at least allied industries. Right. So today uh, we have a conversation between uh, ace film, Ghanaian filmmaker, um, Mr. Kwao Ansan. Oh. And he's having a discussion with uh, Aseye Tamaklo, who is also a wow. well-known filmmaker. Wow, love brood in the African pot, pot heritage Africa. Africa. That yeah. Kwao Ansan is coming. Yeah, that's Kwao Ansan. You see why you can't miss it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and um, he's also showing uh, his work uh, or excerpts uh, of his work across the years mm. um, and uh, I mean there are interesting things to learn about him that he's actually a totally creative person mm. and um, so maybe just as a teaser to, to, to uh, viewers he's, um, he's done more than even the films that uh, uh, we many of us know of his uh, design cloth his design sets uh, he's uh, scored his own uh, music for the films and all that he's going to share this mm. with us and for those of you who don't know, the Goethe Institute is right close to NAFTA. Naft. I think uh, that is more. But just on a lighter note, before we talk about the opening ceremony, I remember African Studies at the University of Ghana. Uh -huh. You know, we, you all have to go in. Yes. It. And they, they are beginning to air one of Kwao and says movies. And then you see the, the pre-movie script, so the name, the director, and all of that. And Kwao comes. And then packed room and block, and we hear someone scream from the rear. <laughs> it threw all of us when he said Kwawas, and that, that came to mind. But the opening ceremony is this evening as well. It's Tell us evening. a bit about what we can oh, expect. Right. So usually what we try to do is to keep a very sharp focus on literature. So we have very short opening ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Essentially, it's to welcome the writers who we have, who are joining us from across the world, actually, and also a few dignitaries who actually have uh, been helping with the festival. So at 5.30... PM, we are going to have a short opening ceremony, last maybe around 45 minutes. Okay. And right after that, we have the headline event. Mm. And so the opening ceremony really is just a few speeches, etc. I would like people to come because uh, I believe there are refreshments promised. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and right after that, programming starts. I just would like to highlight that immediately after the headline event, we mm. actually have three very important discussions taken mm. up immediately. And there's this uh, French author Philippe Sanz, a very prominent uh, lawyer, his book, The Last Colony. I feel that it is a really important book in these times that we are seeing the last vestiges of uh, empire, mm. you know, and this book is going to be discussed. So Philippe Sanz is going to be joining uh, virtually from France. Okay. And um, Hina Likimani and a group of other, okay. uh, um, I, I would suppose, very mm. well-read people <laughs> are actually going to be engaging with him yeah. on his book. It's going to be a discussion on uh, Fulani culture okay. also at the same time. And then and we here in Ghana have quite a history. Ab ab absolutely. Centuries. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I think it's really important that we discuss how that whole idea of Fulani culture has entered this current uh, um, society that we have. You know? And then we also have a, a listening of the radio play um, Goodbye Gold Coast. So that's <laughs> all for the Friday evening. It's already packed. Right. Yes. Okay, so we'll get into Saturday and Sunday shortly, but who, who are some of the others, you, authors? You've mentioned uh, Monsieur Sands, yes. but who are the others on, on the bill? Uh, some of the prominent ones. The, yeah, say. some of the very prominent ones. We have, uh, for example, the notable poet, uh, Professor Jabe Wesley. Yeah, she's librarian joining us from the United States. We have uh, Chuma Nyokulo, uh, Nigerian writer, a Hosa Maswen writer, also a publisher. Um, we we have I mean, at this point in time the names are just I know I know there are so many. How many people. are they in all? No, we have more than seventy. Over more than seventy of them. Yeah. So over the yeah. next three days, in yes. fact, from today to exactly. Sunday, yeah. they are going to be they passing. They are going through. to be there, and you meet them. You meet some of the uh, more interesting and big writers. Um, there is actually a workshop with Jennifer Makumbi, uh, and again one of the biggest names in African fiction right now. Um, she actually is here on the invitation of New York University, but they were uh, kind enough to let us also engage with her, and people are going for a workshop with her uh, uh, today, actually. 
Um, so we have a lots of really very uh, big names that are in the festival. Uh, All right. This year. Uh, be before we get into the final bit and talk about people who want to participate, what they can do and all of that. Mr. Akwe, so tell us about Saturday and Sunday. What, what can we expect? So um, it's similar events across the, week, uh, the weekend. Um, there's engagements with uh, writers, prominent ones, and then also uh, younger people who, people who are interested in developing their, their craft. Um, so if you want to get there someday as well, yes, you can also pass yeah, through. Yeah, particularly we have about so, 13 workshops yes, yeah, for young writers. Years. And right. even the workshop started yesterday. Mm. So even prior to the opening, uh, workshops have started. Um, there are workshops for um, various genres and uh, interests. Um, and then again, um, Saturday also has a lot of uh, book launches. Uh, Mamle Wolo or uh, Mamle uh, um, uh, Kabu is going to launch her book Kaya Girl. Yes, I, I noticed that we're going to do some <laughs> book launches. Yeah, so well. there are several book launches across the, the, the week. Uh, yeah, sorry, and I just the, wanted to the, say the that when I saw it, I felt that was very good because in our you know, part of the world, it's difficult to say, I'm going to have my, I have had two book launches. Mm. It's not easy, financially and everything. Mm. So roping that into this, I felt that was, that was, that was super. Yeah. Mm. So there'll be uh, book launches, there'll be um, discussions. And since there are book launches, then there are also books available uh, right. for sale. Um, so people can come and buy uh, and uh, share uh, close moments, intimate moments with uh, artists, or I, well, I'm, more, I'm calling authors. the artists, authors, uh, and actually artists too, because yeah. um, there's engagements with uh, people who um, work in support of literature uh, in that way. Uh, there's also, um, yeah, fun moments, as Martin mentioned. So it's not just, uh, I mean, people think books are boring, but <laughs> books are not. And so people who also like books like to have fun. And so there will be uh, moments to share to her. Um, have a drink or uh, some food yeah. and, and have discussions. Um, for us, the, and also it's the, the events are spread over um, three particular locations. So we have at the Goethe Institute, uh, then we have at the uh, Du Bois Center, uh, particularly at the Foundation for Contemporary Art, mm. and then uh, the Embassy, the, of, the the embassy of the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, uh, Near the Aqua J flyover. Right. Yeah, uh, that's going to host the final event on Sunday. Okay. So, right before I take your final words on who can participate, it just came to mind. Yesterday, I shared this bit about benefits of books, especially as that, that is being lost now. There's no glare, which you would get from your phone, <laughs> no battery needed, so no cost for the environment. <laughs> Uh, for those who like dog ears, you can yeah, go ahead. Can do, yeah. <laughs> you probably won't, it will, probably won't get stolen at the beach, but your mm -hmm. phone likely would. <laughs> it smells good, and there are no pop-up ads. So guess what? <laughs> Books are a very good way of uh, living and expanding your thinking. Final words. Yes, just to add about the book. I mean, who, if, a book, who can if, a, if a book drops, you, you are not afraid it's going to, to get spoiled. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> like your phone screen. Yes. So everyone is invited to the uh, festival. We have things for children. We actually have uh, performances as well. Mm -hmm. So um, just feel free, join us at the Gothi Institute for the three days. It's absolutely free to attend. All ages is family friendly. Yeah. You will get books, you will meet writers. So, everyone. what are the times from when in the morning? So, to so uh, on Saturday, we run from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. On okay. Sunday, we run from 10 to 9 p.m. And there is a kinky party. Yeah. yeah. So, it's free to attend. Oh, yeah. Yes, so free yes kinky kinky yeah. it's a tradition yeah. that has been. And, and today, and it starts at what time? 5 p.m. and ends at 9 p.m. Yeah. Okay, final words. Uh, Mr. Uh, well, uh, maybe uh, for the tech savvy people, uh, you can follow us on uh, our uh, social media handles. So we have uh, Writers PG for okay. Twitter um, and Instagram. Uh, we have Writers Project of Ghana our website, and um, and also our partner uh, website. So Goethe Institute, and then um, yeah. So all these uh, spaces uh, you can access some of the things, uh, all of the things that are going on. All right, and uh, Goethe, I believe, is spelled G-O-E-T-H-E, G-O-E-T-H-E, in case you want to join. You should actually join. Doc, uh, Mr. Akwe, thank you so much for coming. Bernard Akwe Jackson is creative director of Peja. Martin Egbler Wogbe is uh, director of Peja. Uh, thank you once more, gentlemen.
so much for staying here on the AM show and it's getting exciting by the day. The National Science and Maths Quiz has entered the stage uh, of the one eighth stage. And Maxalak Bubai and Emmanuel Bright who've been bringing us daily updates, will join us shortly. First, I've got a sponsor and an organizer in the studio here with me, Irene, Irene Boache Dankwa is Corporate Affairs Officer Goyle Company Limited, and you know they've been doing this with Prime Time for some time. And Samuel Nati Ajo, who is Associate Client Service Director, Prime Time Limited, is also in the studio. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us once Thank again. You. And uh, be before we get into, into the details, especially with our sponsors, Goyle, it's getting interesting by the yeah. day. And uh, we know one of the highlights of the 1-8 stage, which will start tomorrow, is that competition between Premper College St. Thomas Aquinas and Ophiri Payne Senior High School. Exactly. Some have called it the final before the final because this is a big one. <laughs> I'll come back to you, Samuel, uh, to take your thoughts on that one. But let me find out from you, Irene. Mm -hmm. How long has Goyle been doing this with Prime Time? Okay, thank you very much for, um, for having us here in your studios. So, um, Joy has sponsored the National Science and Math Squeeze for the past four to five years. Yes. And um, it's, it's actually part of our social investment intervention and is in line with our SDG goals three, six, and four on achieving quality education. And so um, we, we are on, and, and I can assure you that we'll continue to be on. Yes, because mm. supporting education is one of our main main goals yes mm. so let me find out from you which school did you go to is your school oh featured? you really want to know <laughs> okay so i went to achimoto school yes okay yes All yes right. yes did achimoto win their competition no they are starting at the one eight so stage. watch out for us okay we will yes. watch out for yes. you thank you yes. thank you all right okay that just had to come in but let's talk about the competitions to look forward to um during the one eight stage we know that every competition is important but there's some which are like el classico you know like it's yeah. such a classic pairing and I must say that this is how the schools are paired right you have pots yeah with the schools in and you know so we don't we don't deliberately pair schools yeah. it's randomly it's random. selected yeah. But this one I mentioned, Prempe College, St. <laughs> uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas, and for a pain, it's a big one. It is, it is a big one, actually. Um, you see, for at the one eight stage, we have um, the schools that were sealed from last year's competition. They are the ones who enter, they start from the one eight stage. So usually, they, based on the pot here you mentioned, they would enter into the pot A. Then the uh, schools that qualify from the prelims, uh, mm -hmm. 54 schools, mm -hmm. they will enter into port B and C based on their scores. Mm -hmm. So um, in selecting and picking, uh, well, it's a done at random, like, like you indicated. And then we have had a very exciting contest that's going to come on um, on Sunday. Um, that's a uh, Prempe, St. Thomas Aquinas, and the Philippine um, School. Then there's another one that would have St. Augustine's, Achimputa School, and the Tamale uh, Islamic. Mm -hmm. At least those are the two main um, competitors that you, you see something Happy. Interesting they pairings. Have four former champions all competing. Mm. Yes. Um, so others are there, and I know the surprises are going to start from this level. Yes, yes. And then there will be major upsets because St. Yes. Thomas Aquinas goes into this with a, as the highest scoring school yeah. from the prelims with 85, 85 points. points. Yes. And Premba College come in as defending yeah. champions. Oh. Ooh, yeah. This one is going to be exciting. <laughs> but let's get back to Goyle. Um, I mean, you are into petroleum uh, products and uh, we know how math science generally fits into the whole concept uh, of, of your work tell us how stem goyle your decision to support the national science and math with all interplay okay yeah, but all, as, I, as i mentioned earlier on so our sdg goals three six and four is achieving quality education and we know that um, um for some for some years now you know, uh, there's been particular interest in, in STEM, in the study of STEM. And the NSMQ has actually provided a platform for especially girls to get interested in STEM. And so that is why we are supporting, it's an educational platform. And so we are supporting um, youth, especially girls, to develop interest in STEM through the NSMQ. Great. As you know, um, through this platform, a lot of the students are able to identify their unique talents and their interests, okay? Mm. And so uh, it, it gives them a bigger platform to identify themselves 
for, 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 for their future endeavors. Yes. Great. So you're sponsoring the Riddle Bonanza. Yes. Tell us more about that. Thank you very much. And so, um, so the Girl Bonanza, the Girl Riddle Bonanza, actually starting from the national championships stage to the finals. It didn't used to be like that. So from the national championship stage to the finals, and we are giving the winning school special prizes from Girl. Okay. Once you win that segment, we're giving you a special gift. And you know this year, we are also awarding the most decent, cheering, and exciting school. That she jama will get, because she jama will. Decent is important, because yes. sometimes so <laughs> yeah. yes, we, 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 need to, we need to put you in check. So yeah. as you are she jama, mm -hmm. ensure to be decent and be exciting, because there's a prize for that school. OK, and this yes. will be given at the, at the finale. Yes. So you're yes. looking, so OK, so while, <laughs> while your school is contesting, answering all the math and science questions, there are those who are also uh, behind the scenes who are, who are cheering them on and they would also be awarded for right. that. So this is uh, the bigger picture beyond uh, the riddle bonanza. But do you mind just throwing in, sharing us some of your products that you have available? Fantastic. Before I go into that, you know, we are giving our uh, uh, quiz mistresses and the consultants fuels on their go cards. And then we are giving Professor Elsie Kaufman a one year fuel benefit. So oh. we're going to put fuel on her go-kart for oh, one whole you. year. Thank you, Goyle. Yes. This is impressive. Yes. Thank yes. you so much. So we have enhanced our, our sponsorship this year. Mm. Okay. And so for our products, um, you know that Goyle is the biggest OMC and the, and, the, and the number one indigenous OMC in Ghana. And for our fuels, Super XP Run 95 and Diesel XP, come in very handy to enhance the performance of your vehicles. Mm. And so we are, giving, we are giving Ghanaians value for their money. We are giving them quality fuels. Our Super, Run, our Super XP Run 95 sells at a normal price even than what the other competitors sell. They sell their Run 95 at a higher price. So you see, we are selling it to you at the price for normal fuel. So you can't get this anywhere mm. than going. Thank you so much. Yes. I'll come back to take your last words for our competing schools. But tell us what it is like. We know that all the schools have arrived in Kumasi now. Yep. What's the picture like? What's the buzz like? It, it's crazy out there now. <laughs> it's crazy out there. But um, at this point, what you would realize if you're on campus, um, you would find supporters, they will be um, moving up, but um, the contestants, for instance, would be more or less reserved because when they are psyching themselves, preparing themselves towards um, um, their contest that's starting from tomorrow. So um, out there, it's fun, it's exciting, <coughs> but the, con the contestants are in their own space mm. trying to uh, get themselves um, uh, up to the level that they expect to do so that they can deliver and perform very well. Just to add to what um, I was just saying, so um, the bonanza, the riddle bonanza, it's uh, the last round. I mean, for me, I call it a make or break round. This is a round where if you're if you if you're losing and you're able to make, take the maximum, you would be able to succeed. Or for a penny in their contest, where, where during the prelims, I mean, they were they were losing. It got to the last round where they were able to make um, as, uh, the answer. By maximizing three. the riddle. Exactly. Riddle. And then, so they took it. And so if you're able to take it's four riddles, if you're able to take three out of four, you have your package. If you're able to take all four, you have your package. Yeah. So right from the prelims up to that point, mm -hmm. I mean, it's all through. So yours is to go for it, and then you'll be, you'll be there smiling. Wow, it's great to have you here. Uh, finally, uh, Irene, yes. your message to contestants. Uh, your school is featuring, but I yes. know that your message will be general uh, to all the contestants. <laughs> yes, um, so to all the contestants, you know that God loves you, and we are here to support you all the way throughout. And so make your school proud, make Ghana proud. Do all you can to win, because we are here to support you, to identify your talent and your, and your, and your, and your skill, okay? because you're the future of, of Ghana. Yes. That's Irene Boache Dampa, Corporate Affairs Officer of Goyo Company Limited. And we've been doing this with Samuel Natiajo, who is with Prime Time Limited as its associate client service director. Give it your best shot, okay? Because you never know. You may not win, but this will open doors for you. Uh, we just always speak about yeah, Francesca sure, and many sure, other sure. Uh, contestants who've had a major breakthroughs by just featuring on the National Science and Maths quiz stage. Well, it's now time to cross over to Kumasi, my colleague Max Solagbaba, and uh, another one from Love FM, Emmanuel Bright, who are standing by. 
Hello, Max. Well, just tell us what to look forward to uh, as the one eighth stage of the competition begins tomorrow. Well, there's a lot. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot we're looking forward to um, here. In fact, yesterday after the draw, um, we went to the Central Business District Kumasi to interact with some people to find out from them what to make, you know, um, of the draw, especially for what many are describing as the finals before the finals. I'm talking about the contest, um, Prepper College um, against St. Thomas Aquinas SHS and then Asantiman um, SHS. I met some market women who were singing the Prempe College um, school anthem. They tell, they, tell me, uh, they tell me that Prempe College is the torch bearer, the NSMQ torch bearer for the Ashanti region. And they are hoping that the gentlemen um, will win um, this year, so they'll be at par um, with Prisek Legon at the top there, six trophies. Um, <laughs> but I have with me here, uh, Yumano Bright Quick, like you mentioned, and then I have Dr. Yurija in Tiamua. He's a 2015 um, contestant, Ben Kum Senior High School. He's a doctor at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital. We'll be doing the analysis. Gentlemen, let's start first of all um, with the contest that many have described as the finals before the finals. St. Thomas Aquinas, Prempe College, Asante Man SHS. Um, I don't see it to be the finals before the finals. Really? Oh, okay, I think you had the odd one out. Oh, over the years, we've seen we've seen big names, big contests, mm. good contestants. Um, actually, last year, Prempe College had Tema Methodist. Mm. They were coming into the 1A stage with a big score. And what mm -hmm. happened? They went home. And here, once again, you see St. Thomas Aquinas in a contest having 85, one other school having 16, yeah. and the last school had one. No, so, Igwafu Ibrahim had 23 points. Okay. And, and Kumbungu SHS had one okay. point. Okay. Yeah. So if we are to say Igwafu Ibrahim was to have 46, mm. like the usual points in the contest, yeah. Yeah. and uh, Kumbungu is to have 23, yeah. and you have to detect from 85. Yeah. What would the score be? But you see, this is my point of departure. Um, because I saw St. Thomas Aquinas at the um, regional qualification contests. They qualified after beating Kimbu's um, senior, uh, senior High Technical School. Um, they also beat Presec, um, I think Presec La. There was another school in that contest. But you know the points they had yeah, at that level? 60. 69 points. Yes. So it means the gentlemen have been consistent. Yeah. Oh. 69 points to qualify for the national oh, competition. Oh, oh, oh. National competition, first contest, 85 but, points. But, but one thing you have to know, uh -huh. that Premier College has an history with St. Thomas Aquinas. Okay. And history favors Premier College. They but, met in but, the you know, but the NSMQ, the national, the, the national Science of Masculine is not about history. It's, oh, it's it, a different set of contestants. No, no, no. So, it is okay, about history. hold on. Right. <laughs> I disagree. I disagree mainly because... Um, new contestants every year unlike a game of football where you can use history you know to judge because it's the same footballers who are playing maybe in 20 if it's 2021 the same set of footballers who are playing in 2022 so you can use that performance to judge the nsmq different sets of contestants every year obviously you agree different brain power difference in intelligence level and all of that yeah um but still some people would argue um St. Thomas Aquinas, they had, um, I would say, less endowed schools or schools that aren't so performing, like the Pong Tamale and then um, yeah. Eguafu Ebrim. So some people would argue that these schools are not a match to um, St. Thomas Aquinas, even mm. comparing them to Prempe College, meeting with Prempe College. Yeah. So they would argue um, it's not quite a match, but we're expecting that perhaps when they get to the 1 8 stage, we'll see the real men, whether they are actually, as you said, they've been consistent um, throughout, mm. whether if yeah. they are able to beat Prempe College, then I can tip them to win the national cha championship for this year. Yeah. yeah. And remember that in the year 2022, we've not really seen much of Premper College. Oh, right. um, in the championship, they got to the semi-finals. Yeah. Opokuwari yeah. School won the um, won, 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 won the champion, the regional championship. Yeah. Unlike 2021, where they won Premper College won the regional championship and then later won the national competition. It didn't happen this time around. Oh, it didn't happen because whenever you win, yeah. Um, there's a whole lot of back and forth. You have mm. to rearrange the team. Some mm. some coordinators go to Dubai. People travel here and there. Mm. We have to set the team up all over again. Yeah. So Premier College this year, they've had their own issues. Mm. 
So you see um, not so good performance in the regional contest, yeah. but then you can't kick out a defending champion just like that. Okay, okay. Quick one, quick one. Um, which could you tip to qualify for the quarterfinals? Prempe, Aquinas, or Oh, actually, I have to give you one history. Yeah. Uh, you said NSMQ is not about histories, yeah. but the 1996 NSMQ finals mm -hmm. was like the 2021 finals, oh, where Prempe yeah. beats Pesek by four points, <laughs> and they beat them by four points in 2021. Okay. Okay. And it's been very long since they met in the mm. finals. Mm. And St. Thomas Aquinas have met Prempe twice, yeah. as far as I know, okay. in the 2017 finals mm. and in the 2020 okay. 1A stage, where they were coming over one of the highest scores like now. Mm. And okay. they were kicked out. They were even last in the contest. Okay. So, you know, I will not debate the history aspect of it any longer because indeed, those who condemn history ignore, those who, who ignore history condemn themselves to not knowing the present. You know, so I will not debate that. Let's move on to the next. So it's Prempe College for you. It's oh. St. Thomas Aquinas for me. Um, I think St. Thomas Aquinas can do so. I, I want Prempe to just get out. That's so. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the next one, let's talk about um, the second contest. The second biggest contest, I should say. Presec Legon versus Sama SHS versus Asante Man, right? Yeah, so Presec Legon is coming into this um, competition. Um, six time winners. They want to make it seven, so that at least they stretch it. <laughs> Prempe wants to be at par at six. Um, Presec Legon is also coming as 2022 regional champions. And in fact, they've won three times in a row. Huh. They are not coming in as just 2022 champions. Yeah. They've been to the finals. The regional champions, yeah. They've been to the finals three consecutive times. Of course, last year they no, were there. Not just the regional champions, mm. they are the favorites when it comes to NSMQ. Okay. Six times champions, first to do the back to back. Mm. And they've been doing the finals back to back to back from 19, yeah. 20, 21. Yeah. Even though they've just won one mm. in that three years, but then they are fantastic. Okay. And it's, it's very difficult to beat them. Mm. Now you love history. So <laughs> at this point, I'll say history also. <laughs> Recent past history favors Shama Senior High School a bit. Um, I saw them in the Western region. Um, they are the Western Zonal Champions. They beat Archbishop Porter Girls. They beat Ghana Secondary Technical School in their own backyard. They beat St. John's. They were beating like all the schools. And yesterday we spoke to them, they were bragging that um, in their subsequent contest, they're going to score one billion points. <laughs> Tell me, uh, who would you put your wager on? Um, I think Presec Legon. Um, Presec, Presec Legon? I, yes. From, from, they, they have the experience, but Shama, I, I don't think they've gone past one eight stage before. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a different uh, ball game altogether for them. Okay. It's going to be difficult. Um, even with um, their yeah, prelim, uh, prelims, I thought they were going to give a huge gap as they gave to JCS, but unfortunately, they were kind of a struggle over there. Okay. So I'm not so sure they might even go past the one eighth, but hopefully maybe they, they will go. But Presec Legon is my favorite. For, Presec Legon yeah. is favorite. I think, yeah, Presec Legon, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, another big one, um, Infant Supreme School, I have a butcher boy here with me, so <laughs> Infant Supreme School versus Techiman SHS and Suhum Presec. It's a foregone conclusion for <laughs> Infant Supreme School, right? But, but, history once again. Infant the one eight stage <laughs> is the nemesis of Infant Supreme School. They lost three, in fact, they lost at the one eight stage three years in a row, 2019. They lost, um, in 2019, they lost to which St. school? St. Augustine's College. In 2020, they lost to Kumasi Academy. In 2021, they lost to Ghana National College. They've not gone beyond um, the one eight stage for three years, back to back. 2022, do you think it's gonna be a fourth time they are not making it beyond the one eight stage? Um, actually, I want them to come back. You want them to come back? Okay. They are, they are one of the big boys. Okay. They can match the big boys boot to boot. Mm. Mm. Unlike, you see, a, a school out of the blue qualifying to semi-finals yeah. and they meet the big boys, they start fumbling. Mm. 
they they have two trophies. Okay. They are two times champions. Okay. Ten seconds. And I think they they I give them the nod. Okay. I think the fancy film school will also go through for me. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll go At, I'm not saying it to make you happy. <laughs> Just to make you happy. <laughs> oh, but I know I know they'll go through. I, I told you earlier that I yeah. just want us to be seated. And okay. I know from what I'm seeing, we'll be seated. Hopefully, okay. we'll get to the semi-finals. Okay. So I think this one is just, yeah. I wouldn't say a cool To be seated, you have to get, get to the quarterfinals. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not saying it's a culture, cool but okay. we'll go. Okay. We'll go past there. Okay, sure. Uh, look, uh, we, we still have more, um, more potential, some potential spine tingling, thrilling contests, you know, um, for you. But check them out on the National Science and Math Quiz Facebook page. Go to the Join News um, social media pages also. you get all of that for yourself. But remember um, that from um, from Saturday to Tuesday, to Tuesday, we have the one eighth contest. We're bringing some of them live to you um, on the Join News channel. So from here, um, the KNUST, um, over to you, Bernis, in the studio. Definitely, Maxwell. Great job there, guys. And it's getting really, really exciting. I can tell even for Maxwell and the team, you know, it's just getting to that point where we climax it all. Uh, but do stay with us, like he mentioned, for all the details on our social media pages. I don't know which school you support, but hey, uh, however you choose to do it, just make sure that uh, you're part of the JAMA so you can win the goal. <laughs> the girl uh, prize. Benjamin is back. Me, 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 me. I, I, I support Akosombo International. Oh, oh, shoot. They are not in the context. I said oh. I went to Infantman Girls. Akosombo International School. Yeah, that was my basic education. We, we never featured in the NSMP. So talk about Infantman Girls. I mean, Infantman. I'm, I'm in purple today, uh, uh, quite that, close that, to That, that makes it even more. Uh, and yes, Hello, uh, man sites. Hello, Ghana. Please, we are not man sites. Hello, Ghana. Happy moment is here. Let's storm World Cup Qatar 2022 with Stop Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks, and Awake Drinking Water from Casa Perco Company Limited. Simply buy your favorite Storm Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks, and Awake Drinking Water, and text the four-digit unique number on the neck of the bottle to short code star seven eight zero hash option two, and follow the prompt on all networks for free. Be one of the lucky winners to this year's World Cup in the monthly draw. You can also win TVs, fridges, microwave ovens, mobile phones, home theaters, free drinks and more instantly. Please don't waste time. Grab a bottle of Storm Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks and Awake Drinking Water and let Storm Carter this World Cup. This promotion is on the NLA Caritas platform and this advert is FDA approved. Remember terms and conditions apply and terms con and conditions apply to us stay here on your set uh, we have to get going <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah we're about to get going to qatar uh you know, we're, we're going to watch the world cup but from us in the studio yeah before this we is go, where we have to go let me say thank you to Dwe ghana for my very beautiful dress Dwe d-o-u-e mm. on instagram and on facebook you can find them they've got very beautiful collections and for men as well benjamin catherine I I should... gordon of catherine garments yeah. she always decks me out you can see what i mean looking all you know, <laughs> fresh and what else here just hit her up and she'll sort you out or you can hit me up on social media i'll connect you you know that thing uh-huh and please hit him up <laughs> <laughs> he needs <laughs> anyway, <laughs> have a nice weekend. Take care of yourself. I'm next is news desk to stay.